My name is Christina Osborne. I work in Stakeholder Affairs. I'm going to be facilitating the web conference. Um, thank you all for joining. This is the Western EIM Carbon Workshop. Um, before I turn it over to Therese Hampton, who's the chair of the RIF, uh, we do have Kimberly Sackman here. She's with our business continuity team. She's going to go over the safety and evacuation instructions. Um, I just want to remind folks that we are going to be taking questions uh, throughout the day. So folks in the room, if you can please use your microphone so that people on the phone can hear you. Also, uh, just a reminder to introduce yourself. And for the folks on the phone, uh, when we take questions, you can by pressing pound two. And also, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, that would be helpful. Uh, we are recording this session. We're going to make it available out on the Western EIM uh, website. So look for it probably um, later this week. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kimberly. All right, good morning and welcome. Just a few quick tips. In the event that we have to evacuate the building, there's a loud alarm that will sound. Also, security will be giving messages over the PA. Please pay attention to the messages being given. We do have floor wardens assigned to this wing and specifically to this meeting today. So they will be dressed in a vest and a hat. Be sure to pay attention to them too. If we have to leave, we have a few different exits. Out here, if you go past the wonderful breakfast that they provided, there's a stairwell that leads down into the cafeteria, exit the doors, evacuation C is out behind the cafeteria area. These doors lead to a hallway, which leads out towards the visitor's lot. That's evacuation B, and you can also exit the back doors. If we have to shelter in place, we will shut down all of these doors. The hex keys will lock us down and wait and listen to the messages being given for that as well. If there is an uh, earthquake, duck cover and hold. If you can't, please just cover your head. Try to bend down as much as possible, cover your head and the back of your neck. Medical emergency, someone stay with that individual. The other person, please run out to the kiosk, notify security. You probably all have met them when you came in. There is an AED machine at the security kiosk in addition to down in the cafeteria as well. Other than that, enjoy your day. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Therese Hampton. As uh, was mentioned, I am the current chair of the Regional Issues Forum, and we are really uh, thankful for you to be being here today. Welcome. Uh, thank you to those on the phone as well. Um, I want to, for those that maybe this is your first Regional Issues Forum meeting, I want to just tell you a little bit about the body itself um, to get a sense for what we do here. Um, so uh, the Regional Issues Forum was started as part of the EIM governance framework, and it's a group of stakeholders and market participants that talk about issues that are not currently in a CAISO stakeholder process. So we talk about things that we might see that could be emerging issues or um, other topics related to the energy and balance market. Um, we meet about three to four times a year, and we are, the meetings are organized and formed by 10 self-selected sector representatives. And um, sector selected, we don't select ourselves. So, oh, sector selected representatives. That's true, we don't. Um, and so I've got uh, some of the other liaisons with me here today. Um, to my right, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Tony Braun, I'm a liaison with the publicly owned utility sector. Pam Scoreborg uh, with Portland General Electric for the transmission owning utility sector. Matt Lacar, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, also a transmission owner sector. And in the audience, we have Jennifer Gardner, if you'll stand and wave, um, and uh, Clay MacArthur from the publicly owned utility sector. I apologize, Jennifer Gardner is with the public interest group sector. And then also on the phone, we have Cheryl Murray, who is also from the public interest group sector. There is an independent power producer sector. We don't have representatives from them here today. So, uh, the sector liaisons, uh, we have conference calls and talk about ideas that we think might be worthwhile to have in a forum, and uh, several months ago we thought it uh, might be interesting to talk about some of the new carbon policies that were being passed and uh, how that might relate to the EIM and the existing approach to accounting for GHG in the EIM. 
And uh, with this turnout today, we're happy to know you guys thought it might be interesting as well. Um, so we're happy that you're all here, and we're really looking forward to a good conversation. A couple of things about the Regional Issues Forum before we start. Regional Issues Forum is not a decision-making body. It's just an informational conversation to try to kind of uh, understand issues and, and really find connections for how you can uh, further the conversation on issues. We hope today that we'll talk a little bit about where some of these issues might be decided. Some things will go to a CAISO stakeholder process. Some of them will be in state rulemaking. So um, we'll kind of uh, focus the direction there. It's also possible we might want to use this forum for further conversation on these topics. We're open to that as well. Before we get started, I do want to um, say thank you to all the people who are willing to be panelists. I think the agenda here is really terrific to get the opportunity to hear from all the different states and from all the different stakeholder and market perspectives, so thank you for that. Um, thank you to uh, uh, SMUD for hosting our Continental Breakfast this morning. Thank you to the CAISO for this uh, wonderful facility, and uh, we hope for those of you on the phone, we uh, purposely chose this facility so that uh, there would be a good phone connection and, and that you can hear well. Um, just a couple of other announcements before we start. The next Regional Issues Forum meeting will be Tuesday, August 27th. It will be in Portland at the BPA Rates Hearing Room from 1 to 4, um, so you can mark that on your calendar. And also for those that are here in the building, there's been a number of requests to go and see the control center. Um, so uh, the CAISO staff has arranged from noon to 1. There's an overlook room that will be available for tours go and see the control center. So um, take that opportunity if that's of interest to you. So at this time we'll transition to our first panel. Uh, the first panel is going to talk about cap and trade programs, uh, Oregon and California. Uh, uh, Colin McConaughey is the Climate Policy Manager for the Oregon Carbon Policy Office, will be presenting for Oregon. Kristen Sheeran um, sends her regrets, but they are still in the middle of the legislative process on the Oregon cap and trade uh, legislation. And then uh, Rajinder Sahota, who's the Assistant Division Chief at the California Air Resources Board and Ben Carrier, Senior Attorney for California Air Resources Board, will be presenting on the California cap and trade program. What I'd like to do for this portion of the of their panel is let them both give their presentations and then we will open it up to questions afterwards. And uh, we will be sure to take questions from the phone as well. So Colin, we will turn it over to you. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the invitation. California. It is not my slides. <laughs> um, I mean, you can give it. Oh, there we go. All righty. Two false starts. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. Great to take a, a brief uh, break from the whirlwind of Oregon's legislative session that is winding down. Uh, and as Therese mentioned, I'm going to give a brief overview here of what we call Oregon's Climate Action Plan, uh, which is the proposed uh, cap and trade program in Oregon. Um, and uh, I'll, that, I'll give a brief overview of that and try to quickly transition into the, uh, how the program will cover the electric sector um, and specifically imported power. I don't have a lot to say, I'll, I'll tell you now, uh, on exactly with any kind of precision how the program uh, will interact with the EIM. That's something that is going to have to be developed uh, and figured out later in, in rulemaking uh, it, as we design the, the, how this program will actually be uh, implemented in Oregon. So uh, just a, a heads up there, there's not a lot of detail we have to, to share today uh, on that. Um, okay, so just quickly here, the proposed cap and trade program in Oregon, I, I have a link there. The, the proposed legislation is House Bill 2020, uh, and for folks who have the slides, there's the link uh, that will take you directly to the bill text. Um, it's about 100 pages, uh, but much less than half of that actually pertains directly to the uh, regulatory program, so it's not as daunting as it, it will first appear. Uh, if enacted, this would establish uh, a cap and trade program uh, beginning in 2021, meaning that emissions covered by the cap would begin generating a compliance obligation uh, January 1 of 2021. Um, and the cap will decline uh, from a, a forecast of those of capped uh, sources in 2021 down to 
a target of 45 percent below 1990 in 2035 and 80 percent below that same 1990 baseline uh, in 2050. Uh, and because emissions in Oregon have uh, increased uh, uh, since 1990, those, those targets uh, are perhaps a little more aggressive than they, or at least the, the initial one is more, perhaps more aggressive than it appears. There's a shallower glide path between the 2035 and the 2050 cap. Uh, and this is a so-called economy-wide uh, cap-and-trade program, uh, meaning that it'll cover the uh, sectors that, that I think folks in this room are, are and on the phone are familiar with. Uh, first and foremost, transportation, Oregon's largest sector uh, and uh, source of emissions. Uh, electricity, uh, which I'll be getting into more in a moment. Um, all uh, uses of natural gas in the state, including electric generation, of course, but also every uh, use of the burner tip as well. Um, other fossil fuels, not, uh, kerosene, uh, propane, et cetera, there's a couple exemptions there for fuels used in aviation, uh, marine, and rail use. Uh, and then finally, uh, a variety of industrial processes that uh, emit uh, greenhouse gases. And it, uh, that, so that's about 80% of Oregon's statewide greenhouse gas emissions, which I think I saw a similar figure in one of California's slides as I skipped through them quickly just now. Um, and so we have modeled this uh, program closely, not identically, uh, to the Western Climate Initiatives uh, program design and in the, in the programs we see implemented here in California and in Quebec. Um, and I've got a, a lot of questions recently from folks about, you know, did, how do we get, how did Oregon get here, where we are, where we are now? So I thought I would include uh, just briefly uh, some background as far, you know, the kind of the milestones over the past decade and more of. Um, how we got here. So going back to 2007, Oregon was one of the five founding states in the Western Climate Initiative. California, of course, being uh, one of the other ones, Washington and New Mexico, two of the others. Um, and as that program design was, was uh, wrapping up, uh, it was not complete, but it, but it was, it was uh, being uh, flushed out pretty considerably by 2009 when Oregon's legislature uh, took up and seriously considered cap and trade for the first time. Uh, it did not pass, of course, that year. Um, but uh, what ha did pass the next year was uh, authority to develop a comprehensive mandatory greenhouse gas reporting program, collecting emissions data from those same sources I just mentioned a moment ago that uh, would be covered by this cap and trade program. Uh, on the legislative front anyway, things went relatively quiet for the next several years until in 2014, Oregon's uh, legislature began seriously considering a carbon tax and uh, funded a study for how at the program design options for designing a tax in Oregon and the economic implications of those uh, options, which then spurred kind of competing debates uh, the next, over the next couple of years in Oregon between a cap and trade program versus a carbon tax, the relative merits between, uh, of being debated between those two programs. Uh, in, two, in 2017, then, cap and trade, uh, I want to say one out, there's still today uh, folks who, who uh, advocate for a carbon tax in Oregon, um, but it, it, it became the, the dominant focus in the legislature again that year. Um, and, that, and the progress made then uh, really paved the way to a very concerted effort last year in 2018 uh, to pass cap and trade legislation. But as an even numbered year in Oregon, we only have five week sessions that proved too brief period to uh, pass such uh, legislation. So what they were able to do was establish uh, funding for the Carbon Policy Office that's within our governor's office, which I'm a, a member of. Uh, and that uh, office, is, our office is uh, funded to basically support legislative leadership uh, in uh, pursuing their commitment to pass cap and trade legislation this year. And that's where we find ourselves today. Just yesterday, uh, our House floor voted and passed the cap and trade out of its chamber, and so it will go on to the Senate perhaps later this week uh, to be voted on the Senate floor as well. And our session ends at the end of this month, so something's going to have to happen by then or not, but we'll know uh, the outcome by the end of the month. Okay, so all that said, electricity. Um, how this program covers electricity or would pro cover electricity um, the easy part is, of course, the, uh, the in-state generation. Uh, that's going to be covered at the generator. Um, the real question uh, that we have puzzled over uh, with a variety of stakeholders, many of whom are in this room uh, over the last year, is how uh, would we cover the uh, imported power? Because we, we, we know we want this program to cover comprehensively accurately, efficiently, and consistently uh, the emissions associated with uh, power imported and consumed in Oregon. 
And as I'll get to in a moment, the, the sec electric sector in Oregon, the landscape uh, looks somewhat different than it does here in California. And so when trying to apply some of the same principles uh, that, that are used here, uh, we, we ran into some challenges as far as uh, mirroring identically uh, the, the same methods and techniques at uh, getting at the emissions as accurately uh, and as, as close to that source of generation as possible. Uh, but, but by those four attributes, those were, those were identified uh, with, again, a lot of the stakeholders uh, that, from Oregon that are represented here are investor-owned utilities, Bonneville Power, public power uh, entities in Oregon. Uh, as, as th these were the kind of the criteria, the, the lens through which we wanted to look at the various options that, that we considered. Uh, comprehensive, again, I mentioned that we want to uh, get a, uh, all imported power uh, it, that, that is consumed in Oregon. Accurate, we need, we need it to be accurate, verifiable, and enforceable if we're going to actually attach a price to this as opposed to simply having the data reported to us. Um, efficient, uh, by, by that I mean both uh, administratively efficient on the state's end, how do we, how do, we do this uh, and implement it uh, with what is likely to be a, a lean apparatus uh, that Oregon uh, funds to implement this program, as well as efficient on the, uh, frankly, on the ends of the reporting entities, uh, that the regulated entities also need to, uh, to be able to, to do this uh, with, with some feasibility as well. Um, and then last, but, but actually definitely not least, these are no particular order, consistent. Um, this was uh, an important criteria for us to ensure that what, the approach we land on uh, applies consistently to the various different entities that, that I'll mention in a moment here that would be picked up uh, for uh, regulation uh, for imported power. Um, and before I do that, I just wanted to show a map, if you can really call it that. I think this is more almost a, a kind of a, a, a cartoon map, if you will. It's not accurate in any sense, sense of the word, other than perhaps the, the border of Oregon as depicted. But those are the balancing authorities uh, that exist in, in Oregon. And what I would, would point out is that the majority of Oregon is covered by uh, multi-jurisdictional balancing authorities. We have Pacific Corps in their PacWest territory. We have Idaho Power uh, on the eastern edge, uh, and we have Bonneville Power uh, throughout much of, of the state in, our, in the public power territory of Oregon. Um, we, PGE is, is, the, is one balancing authority that is isolated within our jurisdiction, but for the most part, both by area and by load and by emissions, uh, Oregon's uh, electric sector is, is, is operated by multi-jurisdictional balancing authorities. Um, and so, I'll just note that what we what we landed on it, and you can see some of this language in the bill. If you're so inclined to pull that up and and look at what what the bill says, uh, what the proposed legislation says on, on imported power, uh, we landed on a term electric system manager. There's no particular magic there in, the, in those three words, but that's the term we we've uh, opted to use. The, these entities are obligated uh, uh, for the emissions uh, from outside Oregon that are attributable to the power that they schedule for delivery and consumption uh, into the state of Oregon. And I have there in the sec that second uh, paragraph the, uh, pretty much the, the direct uh, language from the, the proposed legislation defining uh, who these electric system managers are. They are entities that operate and market electricity generation or purchase wholesale electricity to manage the load or wholesale or retail customers within a balancing authority, at least partially located in Oregon. So uh, I want to draw a distinction here. This is not by definition uh, at all the, the load serving entity. Uh, it definitionally, uh, would, and, and, and in practice in many cases, sits uh, upstream, if you will, of, of that, uh, of those load serving entities. But because of the nature that I just mentioned of, of these uh, multi-jurisdictional balancing authorities that are in some cases also load serving entities, those two are one, often one and the same. Uh, and so getting to the, the crux of this, who, who ultimately gets pulled in uh, by this definition, uh, listed several different types of entities up there. Uh, in many cases, those three uh, investor-owned utilities as operators of their balancing authorities in Oregon uh, would be the, uh, the entity uh, responsible for scheduling uh, imported power for delivery and consumption to their retail customers in the, in the balancing authorities, in the portion of it, of it anyway in Oregon. Um, also, in those same balancing authorities, there are what we call electric uh, service suppliers uh, that schedule power for delivery to direct access customers that are situated in those uh, investor-owned utility uh, balancing authorities. Uh, 
if Monadale gets its waiver uh, here uh, in the near future, as we uh, hope they may, uh, then they would be uh, a directly regulated entity under the program for the power that they schedule for delivery to their customer utilities, the consumer-owned utilities in Oregon. Um, and then there are there is at least one, if not uh, multiple, entities that also schedule power on behalf of consumer owned utilities in Oregon for to, to meet their load over and above what uh, is met by by Bonneville Power. Um, and then lastly, uh, there potentially we don't we this is something we'll have to explore as we. Uh, begin figuring out how to implement this program, but there are potentially other entities uh, that could be picked up uh, for sales uh, through the EIM into Oregon. Which leads me to my last slide here. I just, I once again, pull in some text uh, directly from the bill, which is really what I can, can speak to today as far as uh, what we say in regards to the energy imbalance market. Um, it, this, there is some language that gives uh, the, the implementing agency some flexibility if needed. Uh, we're not sure that it, it will be, but uh, it, for uh, applying the point of regulation for, for sales to the EIM or something similar uh, for, for imported power into Oregon through that mechanism. And it, the language is, is right there. I'll, I'll read it again here. The office may adopt rules as necessary to address the electricity schedule for delivery and consumption in this state through an energy imbalance market or other centralized market administered by a market operator. So once again, uh, just an acknowledgement that, that, that if there is some flexibility needed, it's afforded in, in the legislation there, um, but it, there's a lot more to come in, in this particular topic uh, as far as figuring out how this will be implemented. And again, apologies, I don't have two or three more slides to elaborate uh, from there as to uh, how we think this will be operationalized in Oregon, but I'm gonna have to leave it there given where we're at in our process in Oregon. So thanks again for, for the opportunity. And I would welcome any feedback, thoughts, or ideas from this group. I think a lot of folks in this room and on the phone probably have far uh, better understanding of this certainly than I do. Uh, so we would, in Oregon, would be very interested to hear what folks in the room have to say or uh, any, any helpful advice or thoughts. Uh, much appreciated. So Terrific. thank you. Thank you, Colin. We appreciate that. And we're going to transition uh, to Ben Carrier to give the presentation for the California Air Resources Board, and then we'll take questions after this presentation. Great. Well, good morning. So I'm here to discuss the California Cap and Trade Program and how we cover EIM emissions. Just to go over briefly the goals of the Cap and Trade Program. Uh, there are several goals of the cap-and-trade program. Um, primarily, it's to ensure the AB32 and SB32 greenhouse gas goals are realized through a limit on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, AB32 is the 2006 state law that uh, established a 2020 emissions limit uh, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. It also authorized CARB to create a market-based uh, compliance mechanism to achieve that goal. And pursuant to that authority, uh, CARB created the cap and trade program. SB 32 is a uh, 2014 law, I believe, maybe, or 2016? 2016 law that uh, established a 2030 uh, greenhouse gas reduction goal of uh, reducing emissions uh, by 40% to many levels by 2030. Um, the cap and trade program also provides compliance flexibility to achieve cost effective emissions reductions. Um, so we don't uh, have a command and control program that requires each individual source to reduce emissions. We uh, reduce emissions economy-wide. Um, it establishes a carbon price signals to motivate long-term investment in cleaner fuel and energy efficiency. It complements our existing programs to reduce smog and air toxics. So uh, this goes hand in hand with our uh, SIPs and uh, source-based regulation and our regulation under AB 617 to reduce emissions um, of uh, local pollutants. It also uh, facilitates the integration of regional, national, and international greenhouse gas reduction programs. So uh, we're currently linked with the province of Quebec. Um, we operate a joint uh, carbon market with Quebec, and uh, we were previously linked with Ontario, although Ontario uh, withdrew uh, last year. Uh, okay, so um, this is an overview of the cap and trade program. Uh, the program covers about 80% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. So, so like Oregon, we're, we're covering about 80% of our emissions. Um, we we cover 
um, a few different types of entities. We cover facilities that have emissions of uh, 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year or more. Uh, this includes in-state power plants. Um, we also cover importers' electricity, so these are in-state entities that import electricity from out of state. And we also cover uh, fuel suppliers, so uh, suppliers of uh, natural gas and transportation fuels. Um, I'll note here that, um, and this will be relevant later, um, electric utilities receive free allocation of allowances. Um, this is for ratepayer benefit, so electric utilities are provided free allowances, which they then are required to consign to auction and use the proceeds for ratepayer benefit. And um, I'll show why that's relevant later in the presentation. Um, covered entities must acquire and surrender compliance instruments that match covered emissions at the end of each compliance period. A compliance period is three years. Um, these multi-year compliance periods account for annual variability, so it really smooths out um, the compliance obligation of individual entities. Um, there are two types of compliance instruments. Um, an allowance is, is one, so that's a limited tradable authorization to emit up to one metric ton of CO2 equivalent. Allowances um, are basically the currency of the program. Um, they represent uh, the cap, so uh, CARB issues a number of allowances each year that is equivalent to the cap, and then that cap declines every year. So um, the function of reducing supply um, means that um, entities will need to comply uh, by procuring allowances that will become more and more scarce, and therefore it incentivizes um, emissions reductions from those sources. Uh, it's not on this slide, but there are also offsets, which is another type of compliance instrument. They play a more limited role in the program. Um, uh, currently, only 8% um, of an entity's compliance obligation can be met with offsets, and that will reduce uh, further in the 2020s. Um, so this is how we account for electricity emissions. Um, under AB32, uh, CARB must account for the total annual greenhouse gas emissions in state. Um, so, uh, by definition, in AB32, this includes all greenhouse gas emissions from the generation of electricity delivered to and consumed in California, and uh, that's whether that electricity is generated in-state or imported into California. So, uh, California power plants, those are in-state power plants, must report their emissions under the Mandatory Reporting Rule, or MRR. Um, electricity importers must report uh, their imports based on physical delivery of electricity by source. Um, imported electricity is reported as either specified or unspecified. Um, specified is uh, resource specific, so the electricity importer will report the emissions from that specific resource. This is if the importer knows the resource, so for instance, if it's the owner or if it's contracted with that resource. Um, unspecified uh, uh, emissions are essentially system power, where the importer does not know the, the provenance of the, of the resource. Um, and that is reported at the default emission rate. Um, in the California program, the default emission rate is 0 0.428 metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, per megawatt hour. Um, this is uh, based on CARB's assessment of what the marginal resource is in the WEC. Um, so essentially it's a, a simple cycle natural gas fired power plant um, and it's about 940 pounds per megawatt hour or so. Um, electricity importers um, are also uh, first jurisdictional deliverers, are the first responsible party for placing power onto the California grid. Um, this first deliverer approach is included in the design recommendations of the Western Climate Initiative for imported electricity. Uh, this first deliver approach is, is designed to do uh, a few things. It addresses the interconnected nature of the electricity grid and the potential for emissions leakage. That is that we're treating um, imported electricity and native electricity uh, equally. Um, it applies to electricity consumed in California. That is whether it's produced in California or imported. Therefore, it ensures like treatment of importers and in-state generators under our regulations and maintains a consistent price on carbon by treating all resources equivalently. Um, obviously, if we did not cover imported electricity and did cover in-state electricity, um, the risk is that we would be importing a lot of 
uh, uncovered um, electricity into California and um, not accounting for the emissions from that electricity. Um, this also reflects um, certain constraints. Um, so the, the fact that we, we don't regulate out-of-state entities, we only regulate the importer, the in-state importer, um, and uh, we don't attempt to, to regulate out-of-state entities. Uh, this graph shows uh, electricity sector greenhouse gas emissions from 2000 to 2016. Um, as you can see, um, total electricity sector emissions uh, have declined significantly over that period, and that includes both in-state generation and imported electricity. Our cap and trade program commenced in 2013. Um, since then, electricity sector emissions have declined. Um, you might note that in-state generation did uh, uptick slightly between 2013 and 2014. Um, the cap and trade program covers other sectors, so um, emissions won't necessarily decline in each individual sector every year, um, and there is variability. So uh, from 2012 to 2016, there was a significant uh, drought that reduced uh, hydro production. Uh, and we also had a large nuclear generating station come offline um, in 2013 or 2014 that reduced uh, a significant amount of zero carbon electricity that we previously had on our grid. Okay, moving on to the EIM. Um, so the cap and trade program covers emissions from EIM electricity that serves California load. Uh, EIM importers are, they're also known as EIM participating resource scheduling coordinators, can choose to offer out of state resources to California in the real time market. Uh, EIM imports are the imports that are deemed to support California load by EIM. So um, uh, resources uh, may submit uh, a bid adder. They're not required to, but they may submit a bid adder that represents the carbon price. Uh, if they do so, uh, the bid adder is accounted for in selecting resources to import into California, into the KISO balancing authority area. Um, but it's not accounted for in, in EIM outside of the KISO balancing authority area. Um, if resources do not submit a bid adder, then they're not selected for being deemed delivered to California. Um, EIM imports are reported to uh, or through the mandatory reporting rule at their resource-specific emission rates, uh, and EIM importers hold the compliance obligation for covered emissions from EIM imports. Uh, starting in 2016, KISO and CARB identified that um, EIM did not account for the full greenhouse gas emissions experienced by the atmosphere from imported electricity to California and results in emissions leakage. Um, this is due to, uh, this is also con um, called backfill emissions you might have heard of. Um, it's because uh, the EIM being a least cost dispatch uh, system means that with the addition of the carbon adder, um, cleaner resources are more likely to be deemed delivered to serve California load. And that means other resources are likely to go elsewhere in EIM. So we attempt to account for those uh, backfill emissions. EIM outstanding emissions, um, which is a defined term in the, in the cap and trade regulation, are the greenhouse gas emissions from electricity imported into California through, through EIM that are not reported by EIM importers. So um, again, like I said previously, EIM importers report their emissions at the resource specific rate. Um, and how we calculate EIM outstanding emissions is by uh, taking total EIM imports in megawatt hours, uh, multiplying that by the default emission factor, which again is uh, 0.428 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour, and then subtract uh, the emissions that EIM importers have reported. Uh, in 2017, CARB implemented a, uh, a bridge solution um, uh, where we retired state-owned allowances equal to EIM outstanding emissions. Um, this is only applicable to EIM and does not address um, any future regionalization um, of, a, of a day ahead market. Um, and we did this in order to account for the atmospheric effect of the, of the emissions leakage that is part of EIM. In 2018, KISO implemented a change that limits EIM deeming to bids above a resources based schedule. Uh, this new deeming mechanism is expected to improve the accuracy of greenhouse gas emissions accounting. 
but not fully eliminate the leakage issues. So essentially, um, deeming occurs above the base schedule, uh, from the base schedule to the upper econ economic bid, um, but not below the base schedule, so, so it limits leakage as a result. Um, in 2019, so effective April 1st, 2019, uh, CARB implemented EIM purchaser requirements, which placed the responsibility for EIM outstanding emissions on entities purchasing EIM electricity. So this, this shifts the obligation from the state, so the state retiring uh, state-owned allowances to EIM purchasers. EIM purchasers are California electric utilities that receive freely allocated allowances and purchase EIM energy to serve California load. So like I said earlier, electric utilities um, receive free allowances for ratepayer benefit. Um, and uh, through this regulatory change effective April 1st of 2019, those electric utilities are also considered EIM purchasers if they uh, purchase EIM energy to serve their load. So out-of-state EIM load and generation do not incur any obligation for EIM outstanding emissions. Again, we don't regulate out-of-state sources. Um, and EIM purchasers collectively address EIM outstanding emissions through a deduction to their freely allocated allowances. So this isn't considered um, part of electric utilities covered emissions. Um, we merely deduct uh, what is already provided to electric utilities freely uh, in order to account for EIM outstanding emissions. Outstanding emissions are apportioned to EIM uh, purchasers on a retail sales share basis. So that is we uh, divide um, the individual EIM uh, purchaser uh, retail sales by um, the total EIM purchaser sales, that is the uh, retail sales from all EIM purchasers in order to determine uh, the share that each EIM purchaser is responsible for. This ensures the environmental integrity of the cap and trade program um, because there are fewer allowances in the market as a result of reducing free allocation to electric utilities. So uh, looking ahead, um, we will continue to track emerging electricity market issues. Um, we will continue our collaboration with CAISO on EIM and potential day ahead market expansion. Um, we would say that uh, potential expansion of the day-ed market um, will require different approaches um, for how we account for emissions. And uh, we also continue to engage with other jurisdictions on potential policy alignments and linkages. Uh, so with that, um, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the RIF liaisons here at the table are helping to facilitate and ask questions. So I'll, I'll turn first to them to see if they have any questions they want to ask the panelists. And for those of you in the audience, if you have a question, if you want to just, just flag by raising your hand and we'll get to you. And Ben and your ginger, I was wondering if you could give a little background on the uh, your thinking with respect to, uh, yeah, it's a little weird, there's a podium in between us. Um, what drove you to the conclusion that you needed to uh, account for the outstanding emissions slash secondary dispatch as far as your regulatory obligations? And then to, uh, as we walked through that process, there was a lot of discussion about uh, netting the emission reductions overall from that total. And if you could give the uh, room and the folks on the phone, which is, up to about 125 now, by the way, um, uh, a, uh, a sense of, you know, what your thinking was in that regard. Thanks, Tony. And yes, it's a little awkward to look around the podium. Um, so good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, ben, thank you for taking ARB's role and giving the presentation. Uh, so the whole question about how to how to think about the electricity sector and accounting for California goes back to AB 32 as Ben presented in his slides. AB 32 is very specific language about what needs to be accounted for in the state inventory. And it specifically talks about electricity imports. It's not like it talked about transportation, uh, life cycle emissions or anything else, but it specifically called out imports because California is a large importer of energy on the West Coast. We do not produce 
I, I think we produce maybe half of the energy or slightly more than half the energy that we consume in the state. So back in 2006, it was recognized that the sector needed to include those imported emissions and it's explicitly called out for an AB32, which means that our statewide target for 2020 and then the subsequent target, which is 40% below 1990 levels in 2030, are built off a number that includes in that scope imported electricity. Moving from that inventory scope and those targets that we set, we have the cap and trade program. The cap and trade program is tied to the scope of the inventory. And so it also needs to account for in-state generation and imported electricity. And Ben talked through a couple of the issues that arise if you don't treat in-state and out-of-state equitably. Um, the other part of the issue there was in AB 32, there's specific language about emissions leakage. So when those terms were put into the legislation, they were not defined. But over the course of the rulemaking, the WCI Inc. process in 2008 to 2010, we had a public process for WCI, and at the same time, we were in parallel working on the cap and trade rules and the cap and trade regulation in California. It was clear that the caps also needed to include all of those emissions, but recognizing that we couldn't probably get all of the emissions and we needed to minimize leakage as much as possible. So we started to look at where are the opportunities for leakage. We thought we had a really good handle on it when we set up the electricity sector. There were still concerns that there would be shuffling of contracts or resource shuffling going on outside of um, ARB's purview or ability to see some transparency in the contracting process where sources would be attributed to California, but those actual emissions would sit outside um, and not be attributed to California as they should be. So in the conversations with some of the members of the legislature, some of the committee staff over at the assembly and just through the natural stakeholder process, we realized that when EIM came out, we needed to make sure that it also looked at the emissions leakage issue. Concurrent to that, there were conversations going on at the a governor's office at the Capitol and several of us were in those conversations and it was about regionalization. Those were going on in parallel and behind the scenes our staff were implementing the program. As we were implementing the program, we started to see some patterns and we started to hear from stakeholders that they thought they had a compliance obligation because they thought they submitted or provided power to California, but they were not getting deemed uh, to California as part of the EIM. So we followed up with CAISO and through that discussion, Jointly, we realized, yes, there was something happening here that didn't fully account for all the emissions to the atmosphere for power imported into California. And that really is a tension here, the tension between having an economic dispatch in EIM versus the full accounting that to happen for emissions and GHG accounting at the state programs. And through the course of that, we realized we need to find a solution. There were two years of workshops jointly with CAISO and ARB, some here, some at ARB's offices and we came up with the EIM Outstanding Emissions and a way to capture those emissions without interfering with how the EIM is actually designed. So keeping that still at an economic dispatch process, but then maintaining the integrity of our cap and the cap and trade program by calculating what that difference was in those missed emissions and then retiring those allowances. Now, the state was retiring those allowances. Most of you that are familiar with California's program know that the state's allowances are sold at auction. That money then is used to fund other critical programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and now it's being used to protect communities and clean up toxics and criteria issues in local communities in the state. And so the money became important at some point. It's very important at the legislature. We're going through budget session right now, and we needed to figure out a long-term solution on EIM. So we decided that an appropriate way would be to actually shift that allowance retirement from the state to the electricity sector. And through a public process, we came up with a way to proportionately provide that um, accounting back to the electricity sector and still maintain the integrity of the program and still be in compliance with the statutory requirements in AB 32. Does that help? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I have a question for Colin um, related to the, you talked about uh, rulemaking specifically to deal with imports. Um, what, what's the, assuming, right, I know that there's still legislation that needs to pass, but if we were to just assume that it passed before the end of June, how soon would a rulemaking uh, like that begin and what kind of issues related to EIM imports would you see within the scope of that rulemaking? Maybe I'm asking you questions you can't answer. <laughs> Um, maybe they're at the end. Uh, th thanks, Therese. Um, uh, but certainly I, I can speak to 
the anticipated rulemaking process uh, beginning uh, really uh, right away. Uh, is, uh, there are is some existing capacity uh, at the state to begin that rulemaking, uh, and we would certainly need to begin uh, hiring for additional capacity as well. But we anticipate uh, rulemaking being beginning and including how uh, imported power would be addressed by the program uh, this summer. Uh, at, at the, to be about as precise as I can. Uh, so, uh, and, I, and I suspect that uh, treatment of imports through the EIM would be a part of, of the early rulemakings. Um, that, that, that's something that certainly that's, that's, uh, we've, we've grappled with and, and, and explored already with stakeholders, as, as I mentioned. Uh, and and we, this is certainly an area where the bill for as, as prescriptive as, as it is in many places, this is some, uh, a place where we would certainly need to put a much finer point uh, in rule as to who the, who the obligated parties are and how, and how that greenhouse gas accounting and compliance obligation is, is computed. Great. Thanks. I have a follow-up, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, and it's, I think it's probably for both of you that I, I have assumed that Oregon has intended to create a program that would be linked to California's program, and so can you share with us a little bit about the conversations related to linkage and whether any of these issues uh, impact linkability or not? Um, I can go first, Colin, Great. that's okay. Yeah. Um, so in California, as Ben noted, we are linked with Quebec, and we did go through the linkage process with Ontario, and subsequently they left the program, um, but the program is designed very resiliently, and we weathered that um, quite well. But in terms of linkage with other jurisdictions, it would be the same process. We would be looking at the SB 1018 requirements, which are, are the programs equivalent in stringency or is the other program more stringent. There's enforceability equity that needs to be there, liability to the state, and um, I forget the fourth criteria. Do you know off the top of your head then? Yes, enforceability, right, the mo one of the most important ones. I would focus on stringency, and I make the legal team focus on the other three. Um, but we would have to go through that process. And at this time, you know, with the bill, that's, that doesn't reflect the full Oregon program. That reflects some part of the program. And I think we'll be um, watching and waiting to see the rulemaking process play out in Oregon as they design their final parts of the program and we have a clear picture of what it looks like. Only then would we be able to begin the process of SB 1018 findings, and that would potentially lead to some linkage rulemaking in California because not only is it the findings to the governor under SB 1018, but it's also us having to amend our rule to recognize Oregon's program um, and its compliance instruments. And so uh, there's no clear date on it, um, but we hope that we get there, and it's helpful that uh, the Oregon program did look at the WCI design documents um, as they were looking at their bill language and hopefully a reg language. Uh, yeah, I'll just add from, from Oregon's uh, perspective, uh, I think it, we've long thought that the linkage uh, with the California and Quebec system would be uh, beneficial uh, to the efficiency and, and cost effectiveness of, of the program, uh, and, and particularly in this sector of, of electricity and, and import electricity harmonization between the programs uh, offers some, some clear advantages and efficiencies. Um, but as Rajinder said, we need to set up our program first. We need to make sure we need to, we need to get the program running and running uh, well for Oregon. Uh, and we have, uh, in much uh, more general terms, that, that compared to Senate Bill uh, 1018. Uh, but but in, our, in the proposed legislation, uh, some similar uh, considerations that Oregon w would need to make as well as in regards to uh, any potential linkage with another jurisdiction needing to have comparable stringency and enforceability uh, and scope and, and, and ambition. So um, I guess in short, Oregon uh, needs to stand up our program uh, first and then, and then uh, the jurisdiction uh, collectively uh, on our own and together would be looking at the compatibility of our programs. And I'll just add a little bit more to that for California. You know, when you talk about linkage, we always tend to default back to how we're linked with Quebec, which is a full bilateral linkage where there's fungibility of all instruments. Our reg now includes options for different kinds of linkages, one-way linkages, whether we're accepting instruments from another system or we're sending instruments to a different system. 
from outside of our LINCH program. And so as we move forward and we start to see some of the activities that we're seeing in states like Oregon who are moving ahead on climate action and potentially other jurisdictions that may want to do this, we may be looking at different models and that's perfectly okay and it's great because we do want to support all the programs that are coming up. Um, but we do know that SB 1018 sets a certain bar and that's really about us taking instruments from a different program. And so we remain committed to actually working with other jurisdictions, but we are open to different forms of linkages depending on decisions and the ultimate design of those other programs. Thank you. So now we'll uh, turn to questions in the room. You should have a um, microphone in front of you or there's a microphone in the back of the room and I've got Claire and then Jennifer. Thank you. Claire Breidnich, Western Power Trading Forum. Um, I have actually a follow-up question on Teresa's question and, and I take um, your point, Regender, about um, the legislative requirements of, of linkage already being in place and, and um, the fact that you can't have a formal process until um, the details of Oregon's program are finalized. And I also take your point, Colin, that you need some time and some space to get that done. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering is would there, before that happens, would there be a space or an opportunity informally to begin to have conversations? And I think this issue around, the issues around the EIM are gonna be critical. You've got a number of stakeholders in the room who participate in markets throughout the West, uh, Oregon and ca uh, California. Um, Oregon, I note that your three investors are already in the EIM. Um, we've got a number of the other California BAs that are cut into the EIM. Uh, getting the, the issues right in terms of, of aligning those, um, at least in the view of my organization, is, is pretty darn critical. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is there room before the formal process occurs to begin to have, start having those conversations among each other and with stakeholders and with the CAISO? Um, so from our side, we're always available to make our, to be, you know, open to talking with other jurisdictions. It will be no surprise to anybody in this room that um, because Oregon was a founding member of WCI, we have remained in contact over the years as bills have been formulated and moving through the process in the Oregon legislature. Um, but we also recognize that as sovereign jurisdictions, each jurisdiction has its own sensitivities and own priorities and own needs in terms of getting those, that legislation sorted and passed. And so in this case, then taking more of a wait and see approach and available for any technical answers or explaining anything that we've done here. As the Oregon program uh, moves forward and there's a rulemaking, um, we, we will be completely waiting for those calls to be open and to working with them on the regulation. And depending on what the desire is in Oregon on how quick they want to link and how much they can or can't align, um, we, will, we will be open to all of that. So yes, the informal discussions already have, have happened. They will continue to happen. Um, in terms of the public access to those uh, discussions, I think that is something that has to be determined. We did have in the WCI Inc. process, uh, uh, you know, all the jurisdictions in WCI holding a joint public process where all of the stakeholders across those regions could engage at the same time with all of the uh, governing bodies at that same time. Um, what has happened in Quebec and what has happened in Ontario historically is that we, we usually have the government to government discussions and then the stakeholders engage directly with their uh, local governing bodies and we've not had joint processes in the past. Um, but I completely understand the need and the requirement here, given that we're neighbors and given that we have a joint electricity grid. Um, so we will continue to have those discussions. Um, I just don't know about what the formal oppor or informal opportunity with stakeholders will be. I think I would defer to like the process in uh, Oregon to help shape those discussions. Yeah, thanks, Regender. That's a. Uh, I think this is a special case where there may be uh, will need an opportunity for some informal engagement uh, publicly. I, I, I use the word informal because I think as a, at least speaking from Oregon side of things, as far as our regulatory process, there's also formal public engagement that, that we that we undertake. That at least in my experience has always been and really led by the, the state of Oregon and, and with uh, with the stakeholders that want to engage in that process. Um, I but I, in this case, I think. 
perhaps even in, in fora like this, uh, we, we would engage uh, it, it with stakeholders across uh, both states uh, jointly. Um, and I, I also want to add that uh, California and Virginia uh, specifically and her staff have been a, a great deal of, of help and support in helping us understand how their program has worked. So I just want to want to thank ARB uh, here for that. And I and I as I fully anticipate that that forward as well. Um, and that there's a lot of uh, informal discussion uh, that has happened and, and much more, frankly, that, need, that we'll need to uh, when we get into the regulatory process. Um, so a lot of discussion between the jurisdictions. I don't know uh, exactly what uh, joint uh, public uh, uh, imp uh, forums there will be to, for input, uh, but, uh, but I can I take your point, Claire, that in this case there, there may really need to be that uh, opportun those opportunities made available. Um, so I'll leave it there. I can't really speak in it with any more specificity. Yeah, and I'll just add that in California, even if there isn't a linkage on day one that an Oregon program starts, the fact that we cover imports and some of that may be native generation in Oregon, that will require us to figure out how to address some of that compliance obligation overlap and how to deal with it, which would be regulatory changes here. So because of how connected we are on the Western Grid and because of how we move electricity in and out of California, um, we will need to have that conversation here regardless um, through some workshop process. And we would be happy to invite the Oregon folks to be there. Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Gardner with Western Resource Advocates. Um, my question is specific to the Oregon legislation and I'm just curious, I'm thinking about um, the different utilities that we have out here in the West and Pacific Corp comes to mind, um, having a six state footprint. And I'm curious if you could speak to um, some of the challenges of, of coordinating with a utility that has different obligations in, in very different states um, and how you were able to work through that in Oregon. I'm not even sure if you can answer this question, but I, I am especially curious about whether there was a partnership there. Sure. I'll note I have Pacific Core kind of in stereo here in front of me. Um, uh, we have uh, worked with Pacific Core, uh, I would say, from day one, uh, as well as uh, PG and a, a variety of other stakeholders in our electric sector. And uh, as I noted earlier, Pacific Core is not our only uh, entity like that. In fact, that's more uh, the norm in Oregon than not to have these multi-state balancing authorities and load-serving entities uh, in Oregon. And I mean, it, I mean, in short, uh, it is a challenge, and it, and it speaks to the need uh, to for uh, programs like this to grow and expand, uh, for them to be as, as effective as possible uh, for entities that span multiple states. Um, but uh, I would say also that we've, you know, we've worked with Pacific Core for many, many years now uh, on our greenhouse gas reporting program and how to account for their emissions uh, and and. It actually works quite similarly uh, how they report uh, emissions uh, in Oregon as they report for their retail load here in California as well, as that's my understanding. Uh, so uh, it's certainly we have, you know, there are challenges as far as what kind of uh, signal or pol we have policy signal and incentive is this really sending to a multi-state uh, or multi-jurisdictional entity like Pacific Corps in, in their Dispatch decisions, what they can, how they can or cannot incorporate the, the policy signal coming from one of their states uh, when it's not coming from all of them collectively. Uh, I will acknowledge that, but uh, it's, and again, that just speaks to the, the need and the hope that in the future uh, programs like this expand uh, and that uh, policy signal does become more and more effective uh, across um, these multi-state jurisdictions. But I, I think I'm going to have to leave it leave it there. Um, next to Jennifer. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> Brian Bearing with Ellison Schneider and Harris. Um, question about as other states are looking at uh, adding a carbon price into their dispatch, um, how that might affect the excess emissions obligation calculation that's done by the CAISO in the context of the mandatory reporting regulation. It seems to me that, you know, as there are carbon prices elsewhere, that could affect the quantity of the excess emissions obligation. Um, so I'm wondering if the ARB has thought through that or if you expect that uh, that uh, calculation may need to be updated in the future. Um, so thanks for the question, Brian. And I think that speaks to 
how nothing stays the same, um, and the cap and trade regulation was adopted in 2011, and it's been amended seven or eight times since then as things have changed. And I think you saw in Ben's presentation at least twice on the issue of EIM. And so as things evolve and new information so light, of course, we're going to go back and revisit that and try and address those issues. If more states start to look at carbon policy, first we're going to celebrate because that's a great thing to have happen. Um, and then we're going to make sure that we're not somehow um, overlapping on a compliance obligation or carbon pricing policy on imports coming into California that are already subject to something as part of native generation. Travis. Uh, hi, Travis Kabula, EIM governing body. Um, question, uh, two questions. Um, first, to Colin, I, I, I'm just trying to understand the difference between electric system manager that's used in the Oregon legislation versus first jurisdictional deliverer in terms of a compliance point for imports. And then uh, a question for Rajinder Ben. You know, there's been a lot of emphasis on outstanding EIM emissions associated with the kind of resource shuffling phenomenon. Um, but most trades in the Western interconnection are still uh, through the bilateral market. Um, and obviously there, people are able to specify their emission source and designate it for imports. I wonder if um, CARB does any market studies of trading behavior of entities that might be designating certain sources for imports into California that are uh, clean and not subject to um, the AB32 regulation, uh, even while holding back for their own native load uh, resources that have emissions and kind of accomplishing in essence, a more profound resource shuffle than would exist simply through a centralized balancing market. Uh, is that type of behavior that you study or ascertain the amount of within the market? Uh, thanks, Travis. A good question. Uh, how does the, uh, the different term uh, electric system manager that we've uh, used in the proposed legislation in Oregon uh, differ or not from uh, first jurisdictional deliverer as it's used here in California. And, uh, certainly our attempt was not to, differ, to, to create something uh, different, it's quite the opposite, it's trying to uh, apply that principle to the electric system in, in Oregon. And we believe that uh, as, as it would be implemented in Oregon, the, the, those electric system managers, as I described, those different types of entities, are in fact the entity that, uh, that first owns that power as it is brought in and scheduled for uh, ultimate consumption in Oregon. So that it was, it was an attempt really to take a step back and, and look at this issue uh, of regulating efficiently and enforceably and comprehensively imported electricity in Oregon, uh, given our, our, how our sector works in, in, in the state. Um, so we, we, kind of, we, we kind of Try, I've essentially tried to uh, recreate it perhaps from, from old cloth. I don't know, maybe we made more work for ourselves than we needed to, uh, but uh, that it was really our attempt at, at uh, applying the same principles that I believe were used uh, in the WCI program design and, and, and implemented here in, in California and Quebec uh, for, for Oregon. So there's, it's, it is, uh, we believe, uh, applying that, that concept uh, to, uh, to Oregon. And, Perhaps unnecessarily uh, uh, coming up with it with a new term for it, but it was it really we really wanted to uh, create an approach uh, that, that worked best uh, for Oregon and with with our, our stakeholders. And so I guess as a product of that, we and, and as, as a part of that process also uh, created a new term. Yes, so I think we're, we're utilizing the same design principles, and even though we used different terminology. Um, the term first jurisdictional deliverer in the California cap and trade program encompasses electricity importers and uh, uh, in-state power plants. Um, for electricity importers, um, it's the first entity uh, to purchase uh, out-of-state uh, electricity and um, receive it in-state. So we hit that, that first entity, um, the purchaser, uh, that's importing electricity into California. And then on the question about the resource shuffling outside of the EIM, so we do have some safe harbors in terms of what isn't resource shuffling in our regulation. We do have a prohibition on resource shuffling, and when data is reported to ARB, it is subject to third-party verification and subject to audits by the ARB staff. 
So we already have a system of control set up at the very beginning of the reporting process um, to prohibit and monitor and look at the data that's given to us in terms of research shuffling. When we do see big changes happening uh, for specific entities uh, in terms of what they're indicating today for reporting versus what they did last year, the year before that, staff does follow up to understand what has led to that and how it fits within the requirements of the regulation. So the cap and trade program came into effect in 2013. We have uh, five data points, 13 through 2018 right now, and having a, sub, a sufficient amount of data is important to do the kinds of market analyses that we think um, it's time to start looking at, and resource shuffling more broadly is one of those kinds of analyses that we want to um, look at. There have been attempts before to use maybe one or two or three years of data to look at some of these issues or other issues in the cap and trade program. The early years of the program, everyone was learning. We had to go through a several reporting periods with entities to figure out how to get them to report accurately, make sure we went back and adjusted some of the reports appropriately to make performance. But now we feel like we have a good data set of at least five years or five data points to start doing those kinds of analyses. So yes, we will be looking at those. I'm going to prepare those on the phone. We're going to come to you. We're going to take one question in the room and then ask those in the phone uh, if they have questions. So I think, uh, can I tell the operator? Can they put their hand up? Tell me. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Frank. Great. Thank you. Uh, question. My name is Frank Harris. I'm with California Municipal Utilities Association. Uh, one question. I want to make sure I understand something that you said about the Oregon program. Um, you mentioned that Oregon will be, uh, for in-state generation, uh, the emissions from in-state generation will, be, will fall under the cap. Um, and I apologize if I, if I should already know this, but, uh, or if it was already mentioned. Does that mean that all in-state generation falls under the Oregon cap regardless of where that generation goes? Uh, good question. Uh, as, as read, yes, the, the proposed legislation would, would not afford uh, us to uh, exclude any in-state generation from coverage. But as Rajendra mentioned earlier, I think both states are going to need to explore, given that our, being, we're neighbors and, and power flows both ways, uh, explore how our programs inter interact in that regard, really separate uh, uh, from uh, the, you know a, a full linkage discussion that was, was has been asked about earlier. Uh, just assuring that our programs uh, don't double uh, regulate uh, emissions that flow or emissions associated with generation that, that flows between the states. So I think that's something we'll have to explore. But but strictly as as written, uh, the proposed legislation would require the the, the coverage and direct regulation of, of all in-state generation. And Frank, in our in our documents and our rulemakings, we've already stated that if native generation is covered somewhere else in a WCI-like program, we would not cover those imports into California. But that would require a regulatory change in California to make sure that those are then excluded. Right. I mean, I, I remember as part of the original development of the cap and trade program back in pre-2012 that it was very clear we were very optimistic that we would see other coverage elsewhere. So now we're, we're seeing possibly an example. I, I, I think this will be a great test of how we can treat that. Okay, questions on the phone? So if you do have a question, you can raise your hand by pressing pound two and please start by identifying yourself. Noreen, let me know if anybody enters the queue, please. Once again, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. We don't have any questions right now. Okay. We have time for one more question in the room before the break. Are there any questions in the room? Okay. Thanks to our first panel. Um, we will take a break until 1030 and then we'll come back and hear from Washington and New Mexico and from other states as well. Thanks. Um, I did want to note there had, were some folks standing around the back. There are some open seats up here in the first and second row. If you are actually sitting next to an open seat, can you raise your hand maybe so folks can help find those seats? There's, a, there's a, another seat over here in the front row on the right side, right here in the second row. Okay, thanks. Thanks for coming back from the break. <laughs> um, So, um, 
Um, one announcement for those that maybe are uh, planning to do the tour of the control center over the noon hour, you do need to be in a non-merchant function. Um, you cannot be a trader and be uh, and go to the overlook room. So um, we'd ask you to just to be mindful of that uh, when you make that decision over lunchtime. So um, we're going to transition to the next panel, uh, which will include the states of Washington and New Mexico. Uh, from Washington, we have Lauren McCoy, who's the Senior Policy Advisor uh, for the Washington Office of the Governor. Uh, we also have Brad Tavoco from Energy, he's, who's an Energy Policy Advisor for the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission, and Glenn Blackman, who's Senior Energy Policy Specialist for the Washington Department of Commerce. And then we will hear from New Mexico, Sarah Cottrell Probst, uh, who is the Cabinet Secretary at the Energy, Min Minerals, and Natural Resources Department of New Mexico. We're going to run this panel similar to the way we did the last panel, where we'll have them give presentations and then open it up for questions. So we will start with Lauren McCoy. This. Okay, there we go, great. Uh, thank you, Therese, um, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, you know, I just want to first of all say that uh, I think, you know, we're really excited to be here in Sacramento today. We have a, a large contingent from Washington State. We are filling a minivan, uh, <laughs> so, so thanks for having us. Uh, as always, happy to come and talk about uh, carbon policy with the uh, folks in the region. Um, before I start my presentation, and I don't know, is it loading yeah, where, up? Do we know or? where the presentation is? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, so before I dive in on the bill that I'm here to talk about today, I think it might be helpful to just do a quick um, background on carbon policy in Washington. Um, when we talk about this bill, you know, I'm hesitant to even talk about it as a carbon policy because it is, uh, in fact, uh, just the electricity sector that's covered by the Clean Energy Transformation Act. Um, Washington State has a long history of looking at economy-wide uh, carbon policy. We are also a founding member of the Western Climate Initiative. Um, and much of what Colin said about Oregon's experience, I think, um, applies to Washington as well. We um, have long supported uh, linked cap and trade programs. Um, back in 2015 and 2016, uh, Governor Inslee introduced legislation in Washington State to try to enact uh, linked cap and trade programs uh, with other uh, Western states, California and Quebec. Um, and then there have been several attempts um, in the legislature to enact carbon pricing in the form of a carbon tax. And we also had two ballot initiatives in 2017 and 2018, um, which failed at the ballot. So we have, you know, a long history on trying to enact economy-wide carbon policy in Washington. Uh, we have not given up on that. Those conversations continue in various forms. And I think, you know, the reason that I'm here uh, talking about clean energy policy in Washington State today is because um, we had a little bit of a shift in strategy in the 2019 session where we were coming off a loss on a carbon fee initiative at the ballot and uh, the governor decided to try to push forward a package of sector-specific policies uh, that together were designed to help meet our state's uh, 2035 emissions reduction targets um, that, are in, that are in our statute. Um, and so this bill was really part of a package that was an economy-wide effort, uh, which included other things such as a clean buildings uh, bill, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, and the clean fuel standard, which ultimately did not um, pass the legislature. So it's, you know, I would say these efforts on carbon policy in Washington are going to continue. Um, but today I'm here talking about the clean energy policy, which is an electric-specific policy. So. Um, so there are a couple of key provisions. Um, th this bill included uh, clean energy standards, which uh, set specific mandates for clean energy procurement uh, applicable to Washington utilities in the state. It also includes some regulatory and planning tools, which I'll talk a little bit about, and incentives uh, which apply to renewable energy uh, machinery and equipment. So the key provisions uh, related to the clean energy standards are a coal phase out by 2025. Um, the end of 
2025 is when our last in-state coal plant in Centralia is scheduled to cease operations, and so this bill applied that same phase-out date to coal imports in Washington. And then there is a uh, carbon neutral standard by 2030, 80% uh, of this must be met with uh, what we're calling clean energy resources, which is renewable and non-emitting resources um, for the jurisdictional utilities. And all of those renewable energy claims must be documented with RECs. So this is a very similar um, structure to the renewable portfolio standard. We really were building on a lot of the same planning and enforcement mechanisms that already exist. Um, so for utilities that operate in Washington, um, you know, this isn't a wholesale redo of their current planning and procurement um, policies. It is, in fact, complementary. Um, and then it adopts a policy to transition to 100% clean electricity by 2045. Um, that date is similar to uh, other states, including Hawaii and California's SB100, which interestingly, I don't think anybody's mentioned yet today. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, one area where I think if we, if we look at the timeline for implementation, you know, um, you see a trend where states are looking towards transitioning to 100% energy in Washington, we went with the 2045 um, date in our bill. So just really quickly, um, this is a pretty simplified uh, schematic of what's happening here. So on the left, you have our current renewable portfolio standard, um, which was 3% by 2012, 9% by 2015, and 15% by 2020. So we are building on um, that ramp up uh, to a 80% uh, clean, renewable and non-emitting with a 20% alternative compliance obligation on top of that in order to get to the um, carbon neutral or net zero standard by 2030 and then 100% uh, clean by 2045. Oh, sorry. Um, so real quick on some of the enhanced planning requirements in the bill, um, it does rely on the existing integrated resource planning um, policy in order to uh, sort of show how utilities are going to get to the standard, but it includes new provisions that um, uh, require shorter term clean energy implementation plans. This will also, this process will also be used to set the interim targets, um, which are going to be necessary to get to the long term standard. So those plans are overseen uh, for investor owned utilities by the state's Utilities and Transportation Commission, which are here, they're here today and then by the local uh, governing boards for consumer-owned utilities in our state um, with an oversight role by the Department of Commerce State Energy Office. It also requires utilities to use the social cost of carbon in planning procurement and acquisition, and that um, value is uh, specified in the bill. Um, so that will be another new thing that will affect um, you know, how resources are selected um, on a cost effectiveness basis. And then we're also um, directing the Department of Commerce to develop an updated state energy strategy by the end of 2020. Uh, the current state energy strategy, I think, was last developed um, going into 2012. And so, you know, it's time for a refresh look uh, at how we're going to implement the state energy strategy of the state. Uh, one thing that we heard consistently um, from stakeholders on this is, you know, ha really hammering in on the cost and reliability issues. There were there were many studies done in advance of this legislative session, looking at um, various uh, carbon and clean energy policies and the cost, uh, their impacts on cost and reliability, and that work uh, I think informed a lot of the policy design. Um, and so just here, you know, very quickly summarizing some of the things that are in there. Um, there is a cost cap in the bill, which is really structured around um, a rate impact uh, control mechanism that will basically provide a pressure release valve if the utility is able to show that rates are going to increase uh, over 2% per year as a result of this policy. Um, they effectively will be uh, allowed to be deemed in compliance with the policy uh, while they're implementing, um, while they're meeting that rate impact cap, um, and it serves as sort of a temporary uh, compliance um, uh, path. 
And then it also requires an assessment of energy burden and the adequacy of utilities energy assistance programs to low-income customers. Um, the bill requires utilities to offer a low-income energy assistance programs. Many of our utilities are currently already offering programs like this, but this provision would uh, basically require them to take a closer look at how those programs are structured to target customers with the highest energy burden in their service territory. So we think that this will help you know, ensure that those programs um, are providing more robust and targeted assistance where it's, where it's needed most. It also allows for a temporary suspension of the standard to protect reliability and a waiver of the penalty if um, utilities can demonstrate that reliability requirements um, may not be met as a result of trying to, to meet this standard. And then there's also regular um, assessments done by the Department of Commerce in consultation with stakeholders looking specifically at reliability and cost. So market issues. Um, so the Oregon presentation, I think, had one sentence in their, in their bill directing them to look at this as well. This is, this is our bill language. Um, I just decided to post it here for folks for reference. Um, and we worked on this language uh, with a lot of folks who are here in the room. So just thank you to you know, many of our EIM entities who uh, assisted in trying to get this right. Uh, and basically, you know, we're recognizing that there are issues that we're going to need to sort out as it relates to how EIM imports are handled uh, under this policy. And so it directs the agencies to um, actually adopt rules by mid-2022, uh, looking at the retail electric load that's met with market purchases uh, in the Western EIM or other centralized markets. Um, and to address the prohibition on double counting of non-power attributes that could occur under other programs. So, you know, I'm glad that we're here today. I think this is the beginning of a long conversation about um, what our options are for addressing EIM purchases under this policy, and then also making sure that we're integrating properly um, with the other states that have um, uh, carbon policies that are affecting EIM. Um, and then just really quickly, I think another key point uh, about this bill is that it expanded our, you know, definition of sort of what eligible, what eligible clean resources are to include hydropower. Washington, you know, is a um, majority hydropower state. We have, you know, almost 70% uh, of our power being met through hydro. And this allows the hydropower generation from existing dams to be used for compliance with um, the clean energy policy and to generate renewable energy credits uh, to be used to demonstrate compliance with the policy. It also allows uh, Washington investor-owned utilities to um, earn a rate of return on a power purchase agreement, which, uh, you know, the intent of that was really to try to make uh, some of those IOUs indifferent as to whether they build or buy clean energy resources in the hopes that some of them, you know, might want to purchase uh, some of that hydropower for use for compliance. And then it um, addresses some of the issues that we heard around uh, hydro variability by basically allowing for multi-year compliance. So utilities um, are able to, utilities that are hydro dominant can sort of look at their hydro generation over a four-year period and allocate it accordingly for compliance purposes over the four years. And then I think another um, important aspect of the policy is the way that it harmonizes with our existing renewable portfolio standard. Um, it basically allows, you know, utilities that um, uh, were concerned about sort of requiring them to be more than 100% clean, you know, if they're already 97% hydro and they have to continue to purchase uh, renewable energy credits under the existing RPS, they were concerned that, you know, effectively they have a 100 and 12% compliance obligation. Um, and so what this does is beginning in 2030, um, those utilities that are already 100% clean can be of their 937 uh, requirements um, if it would cause them to exceed that. And then it also allows for the investments that are made um, under the existing portfolio, renewable portfolio standard to be counted for compliance with the new bill. And then finally, um, allows for the generation due to efficiency upgrades at the federally owned um, 
dams to be an eligible resource under the renewable portfolio standard. This has been sort of an ongoing um, issue where the utility owned dams, the upgrades at the utility owned dams were eligible, but the federally owned dams were not. And so the utilities that were um, paying for those upgrades at the federal dams, it was really a parity issue for them. So that's that's basically, <laughs> that's the bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, along with uh, Glenn Blackman and Brad Spolko from the UTC. Great, thanks, Lauren. And so we'll turn to Sarah Cottrell Phillips and talk about New Mexico's bill. Well, hey everybody, thanks for, um, thanks for including the Land of Enchantment in the program today. Um, I really hope that you'll come see me if you're ever in Santa Fe. Um, we're really excited to be here and be re-engaging on, on regional electricity issues. So I, I just, I, I know some of you may know this, but the ecosystem of agencies in New Mexico is important to understand. It's a little different than some other states. Um, it, we have a, the Energy Minerals and Natural Resources Department that I, I'm the Cabinet Secretary for, um, is about a 475 person agency and renewable energy one piece of what we do. Um, if you were going to equate um, agencies to federal agencies, we would be the closest to the Department of Interior. Our Environment Department is closer to the EPA. And then, as, as you probably know, we have an elected public regulation commission. Um, so our, our department covers, um, on any given day, the Conservation and Management Division is where the renewable energy expertise is housed, and there's about a baker's dozen of folks in that in that part of our agency, so pretty small. Um, we also cover forestry. We permit new mines and existing mines and abandoned mine land programs. We work on um, permitting, we permit oil wells and gas wells from, from the beginning to the end. Um, we have the state, 34 amazing state parks that you should come visit, and then, and then of course, administrative services. Um, so just, that's a, just a sense of who I work for. So really exciting, um, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, our, our newly elected governor, um, one of the first things that she did um, in taking office in January of this year was to issue a uh, climate change executive order. And the executive order is designed to not be everything that we're ever going to do on climate, but to set us back on a leadership course on, on climate change. It includes a number of directives. Um, it, it started by joining joining the state into the U.S. Climate Alliance um, set of, of governors and jurisdictions, um, setting a statewide greenhouse gas reduction goal of 45 percent by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. Um, then um, it, it set up a, an interagency state government task force. Um, the task force is co-chaired by me and Secretary Jim Kenney from the New Mexico Environment Department. Um, and the initial recommendations from the task force are due September 15th. And the magic of that is that it's just enough time before the legislative session that if there are budget or legislative matters that we need going on, we'll have identified them by September. It's a little tight in terms of getting everybody up and, and going, but it, um, I think this will probably be an annual reporting process. Some of the very uh, specific things that the, the EO directs us to do, um, you know, certainly a statewide assessment of what more can we do on mitigation and adaptation, but also um, it, it called for, sorry, this is a little crackly, I'm not sure where I need to be. Okay. Okay, thanks. So uh, it, it, two were legislative items that I'm really pleased to say we accomplished. Um, one was to increase the, the state's RPS and the other was to increase the state's energy efficiency standards, neither of which had been touched since 2007 when I was working for Governor Richardson at the time and we you know, did the last round, so it's been a while. Um, the EO also calls for the Environment Department to start working on market-based carbon emissions reduction program statewide. Um, this has not really gotten underway yet in New Mexico, so it's really helpful to hear what some of the other states are talking about now um, and some of the considerations that we'll be, we will be moving in that direction soon. Um, also directs us to look at the, the vehicle emissions options and to improve state building codes. We're still on the 2009 codes. Um, transmission corridors for renewables, um, we are working, um, fortunately our state renewable energy transmission authority got some funding this legislative session to do studies to look at, at transmission corridors, so we're excited about that. Um, and then something that, again, my department and the environment department are embarking on is to reduce statewide methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. It's a huge source of our state's greenhouse gas emissions um, and we need to get a handle on it right away. 
Um, and then we'll be coordinating with our um, independently elected state land commissioner, Stephanie Garcia Richard, and, and her office, um, as well as federal agencies as we move down this path. So the second thing I wanted to talk about today is, is uh, you know, another big bill. A lot of the themes are going to be similar to what you've already heard this morning, but this one has our own New Mexico green chili flavor to it. Um, it is the Energy Transition Act, and it's one of those bills that was an unbelievably heavy lift that took a, an army to pass, um, but in the end it was worth it because we got it done, and, and it was a really strong, really robust coalition that supported it. So Senate Bill 489, um, the sponsors are listed. The sponsors were incredibly personally involved in negotiating this bill. So while I'm here on behalf of the administration and we were involved in it too, this was really a lot of leadership to accomplish and a lot of NGO support and utility support and others. Um, so the bill in a nutshell, um, it, it, it provides for, let me just see, I think I added a second slide. Yeah. Um, it hits on a lot of things. So it sets um, the state on a path to retiring coal, replacing it with renewables and clean carbon resources, um, and trying to transition the affected communities and workforce along the way. So it does a lot of things at once. Um, the Public Regulation Commission is the venue for next steps on the bill. I'm going to talk more about some of the details of the bill, but just to, to finish the slide, um, the, the PRC gets, gets its hands on it and it's next. Uh, so the ETA establishes new renewable and zero carbon emission portfolio standards. Uh, we're currently, uh, the old law was 20% by 2020 for investor owned utilities, 10% for co-ops. Um, now that bumps up to 40% renewable energy by 2025 for everyone and 50% by 2030 for everyone. Now the co-ops do get to count some of their large hydro that they had not previously been able to count, but they'll still have to demonstrate level of effort on top of that. We didn't just change the math, like they're still going to have to, to procure um, sorry that, that that slide is really small, but what the rest of that box says is that for investor-owned utilities, um, the target is 80% or the, the requirement is 80% renewable energy by 2040. This was something the governor campaigned on um, and felt very strongly about. And then we negotiated up from there, and it, it goes up to 100% clean energy, zero carbon resources by 2045, um, as long as safety, reliability, and impacts to customer bills are considered. Um, P&M, our largest investor-owned utility, has already committed to meeting that target five years early by 2040. Um, for co-ops, the standard is 100% zero carbon resources by 2050, um, composed of at least 80% renewables as long as it's technically feasible um, and the system's reliable and not unaffordable. Mm -hmm. Um, and and the, the, bill, the bill did some other important things. It eliminated a couple of loopholes that were in the previous RPS. Um, so all customers, regardless of their size, uh, will be provided renewable energy um, at least equal to these requirements. The second loophole that was closed or issue that was addressed was the cost cap in the RPS. Um, our cost cap had not been working and had been a source of a lot of litigation for years. And the cost cap was amended to ensure that renewable energy continues um, procured to meet the standard um, as long as the average price remains equal or less than the expected fossil fuel prices or gas prices. So that's set at $60 a megawatt hour um, and then adjust for inflation from there. Um, so the, the ETA um, provides some four main tools to help with this transition um, towards renewable energy and zero carbon. Um, one is a process created, the securitization, a process created for um, private bonding authority for an entity closing a coal plant. Um, this is something that P&M in particular really wanted um, to help them um, transition out of the San Juan generating station in Farmington, New Mexico. Um, so this, is, this allows them to get access, uh, we hope, to AAA rated bonds that will significantly reduce the price of, of making that transition. Um, the bill also, second, second um, creates three funds, uh, one at the Indian Affairs Department, one at the Economic Development Department, and one at the Department of Workforce Solutions to provide transition assistance to tribal communities, to affected and displaced workers, and to the communities in general within about 100 miles of the plant um, to promote economic development and job training. And this was really important. Um, 
We, uh, in, in addition to these funds, we, um, in the legislation, also allow the company using a bond um, to provide severance to plant and mine workers, um, along with direct training opportunities for the workers. And then third tool, um, reinvestment in clean energy and property tax base replacement. Um, and fourth, the creation of apprenticeship opportunities of all types um, in energy um, development, all types of energy development areas. So to summarize the legislation, it is a long bill. These all tend to be, um, especially when they deal with bonding, um, but it establishes forward-looking goals for the RPS and zero carbon standards um, and provides assistance to transition away from, um, particularly from coal, um, where it is economic, uh, uneconomic, um, and to develop new resources. The bill does not shut down coal plants, and this is a, a, a misunderstanding that we sometimes hear about the bill. Um, but it, it, uh, it, P&M several years ago had, had started saying to the commission, hey, we think you know we're probably going to want to get out of this coal plant in about 2022. Um, so the bill provides, given that, the bill provides direction and a policy framework that the utilities know exactly what they need to move towards um, and how to plan for the future, and it gives them the tools to do so, and it tries to not leave anybody behind. We're not naive that this is the only transition assistance provided in this bill that the Farmington area in particular might need over time, but it's a really good start, and it acknowledges the, um, the obligation that the ratepayers of, of P&M in particular have. You know, we've been getting really good, reliable, low-cost power from that part of our state for a really long time, and um, the transition away from that is a big deal. Um, so we want to we want to acknowledge that. I have a, a lot more information about this bill and the particulars if you would like to ask questions, but I, I will leave it there for right now. Um, I know this is the energy imbalance market crowd, and I, I, that, that's really great. Um, re, the regional conversations and things like the EIM um, having been developed uh, you know, ahead of, of legislation like the ETA, um, it's an important tool in helping the utilities to integrate more um, more renewables into their system. P&M is well on its way to joining the EIM, and um, you know, we think that, that regional markets and, and regional market issues even more broadly are are and should be considered part of New Mexico's future, so we're looking forward to engaging on those conversations with you. Um, I mentioned the New Mexico Renewable Energy Transmission Authority, and, and this is a, an authority that is, sits in statute. Uh, it, was, it was created in statute and um, exists to help develop that, that transmission infrastructure in our state. Um, and so we hope that uh, because they received some funding this year, both for studies and for staffing, that that entity will be reinvigorated going forward help us and help our state meet the goals. And also, we'll never consume all the renewables in our state um, that we have with our population. So the export opportunities are, are something that we um, want to promote. Um, we had a lot of other things passed this session, too. It really was an exciting year. We had electric vehicle legislation, um, a number of things related to oil and gas and modernizing our um, our agency's ability to regulate that industry responsibly. Um, but again, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. But just uh, know that New Mexico is really roaring back in terms of policy and creativity, and we welcome your thoughts and expertise and insights and look forward to engaging with you on how we can meet these really ambitious goals for our state. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I will start here with the liaisons first if you have any questions. This is uh, Pam Sporborg with Portland General. Um, and I have one question for Washington and one for New Mexico. So for Washington, um, I'm hoping you can maybe talk a little bit about the relationship between the I-937 RPS legislation and this new legislation and how they interact and kind of the interplay between those two and how the REC process works across those two pieces of um, energy legislation. And then for New Mexico, um, does this recent bill give you the authorization to move forward with more carbon policy frameworks or um, like a, a linked market uh, option, or do you need additional legislation to move forward with some of these other pieces that you're talking about? Sure. So um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit, and then I'll kick it over to Glenn Blackman, who's the administrator for the um, Regis, who's our Regis administrator for the state. 
Um, you know, I think that this was one of the things as we were drafting this legislation, we sort of came to this crossroads of, well, are we going to actually try to amend um, the initiative or are we going to try to overlay a policy on top of it? And I think, you know, what we decided was that, you know, the existing RPS continues to provide other benefits, you know, not just around uh, renewable energy development, but there are uh, provisions in there that, you know, really support uh, increased conservation. That's where our um, energy efficiency resource standard lives. There's also um, other policies supported in there around um, apprenticeship utilization, distributed generation, um, things like that that weren't necessarily um, going to be reflected in the new bill. And so, you know, just in discussions with stakeholders, we decided to overlay the Clean Energy Transformation Act sort of on top of the existing RPS obligations in order to preserve uh, what was already there. So, you know, that was that was sort of one of the um, sort of organizing principles around the way that we drafted the legislation. That being said, you know, our goal, and it's, it's reiterated in several places in the legislation, to make sure that these two policies work together and that we are actually not duplicating or, you know, creating, um, you know, additional administrative uh, burden on the folks that have to comply. So with that, I'll turn it over to Glenn, who can say a little bit more about the REC piece. Okay, thanks. Um, the um, Energy Independence Act, or uh, Initiative 937, um, used a, um, a definition of renewable energy credit that was a, a little bit, uh, it excluded hydro, even though um, incremental hydro generation was eligible, is eligible under that standard. With the new law, we have uh, brought hydro fully into that system of accounting uh, and under the Clean Energy Transformation Act, the new law, uh, all renewable resources will have to be documented or verified by retirement of certificates. Uh, that's, a, we think, an important step forward in terms of uh, accountability, both for the old law and for the, the new law. Um, the new law also uh, doesn't allow for as uh, great a use of unbundled RECs as the old law does within the 80% the, uh, the portion of the 2030 standard. Um, Legacy Hydro can be used for that where it was not uh, under the existing law. But it all has to be in a, in a bundled form, has to be associated with electricity delivered to um, Washington load. The other 20% uh, unbundled RECs can be used for compliance or other compliance options too, but um, the uh, geographic eligibility for that 20% is, um, is not as uh, narrow or as quirky as is the case under existing law. So some of you who uh, call me up and ask whether, uh, you know, the geothermal in Utah is eligible or not, uh, maybe you won't have to call me anymore because it's, uh, it'll be more obviously uh, uh, eligible or not. Um, and the, um, within that 20% where unbundled RECs can be used, um, there is uh, a provision that Lauren didn't put up on her slides but is really uh, important in this context, and, and that is that um, they can be used only if they don't result in double counting. And uh, yes, we're going to be doing some rules to try to uh, uh, confirm what that means, but we also think it uh, it's pretty clear what that means and that uh, there is some work ahead for uh, participants in the market in order to get to the point where they can uh, show us that an unbundled REC uh, is not part of uh, some other transaction that um, made use of the uh, non-power attributes associated with that. Uh, and if they can't, then they'll need to find another way to comply with the 100% clean standard.
So you asked about New Mexico's, uh, whether this was economy-wide cap and trade. I do, I do have a good summary of the bill that I can share with people, um, cause I, I know it's long. We've sort of struggled to come up with a short summary of it, but, um, this bill is really focused on the electric sector, um, and creating zero carbon standards for the electric sector. So it's not, um, an economy-wide cap and trade bill. Um, when we worked on the, um, Western Climate Initiative the first time around, um, New Mexico has pretty broad authority already to do to engage in economy wide emissions reductions, including cap and trade. You know, what what we do not have is the ability to auction allowances. So that might be something we'd want to look at going forward. I, I don't that decision hasn't been made, but it that's the distinction in law. So um, the Environment Department will be the lead on any um, economy-wide cap-and-trade um, negotiations, discussions, so I, I don't want to step on their toes, but I, I know that that conversation is, is coming. And um, you know, but, but New Mexico had, um, at the very end of the Richardson administration, adopted Western Climate Initiative cap-and-trade rules through the Environmental Improvement Board. Um, they were rolled back pretty quickly in the new administration, but... Um, so we expect that we could we could move on that soon. A quick question for Laura and Glenn. Um, so first, a couple observations. One, could you have your legislators talk to our legislators on a couple of those issues, like excessive procurement, um, and uh, I forget the other one that popped out on me because we've struggled with those quite a bit <laughs> here in California. Um, the the other thing is like the last issue you mentioned I think is going to become increasingly important. I know in California, and I would suspect as your rules evolve um, and Oregon's too, there's going to be a, a real demand for the zero carbon products, not just for compliance with uh, you know RPS requirements or something like that, but just the desire to show your consumers that you're uh, buying these products and and the energy source disclosure rules and things like that. Uh, there's a, a lot of regulatory uh, work, I think, that needs to get done to align those things to make sure that the sellers can get the appropriate value for those products. Um, where are you at? I, I heard 70% hydro. I heard coal retirements. Where is Washington at right now as uh, compared to where the targets are set for in the future? Um, well, I might address your first question first, which is um, I, I think legislators should talk <laughs> to each other, um, but you know I don't I don't know what we can do to help facilitate that. Um, so Washington, you know, I think one of the things that makes Washington unique is that we have um, a lot of diversity in our utilities. So while on a statewide basis. Um, you know, when you say, well, we're nearly 70% hydro, what that actually means is that some utilities are 100% hydro and some utilities are, you know, 30% clean, 60% coal, right? And so it's hard to, um, when you're looking at, you know, trying to design a one-size-fits-all policy for the sector, you really need to have a lot of flexibility so that different utilities can, you know, implement it in a way that works for their portfolio. Um, that being said, you know, for, for coal retirements, I mean, we had um, a, a pretty interesting announcement uh, last week where, you know, two of the largest um, coal units that were scheduled to be retired in 2022 will actually be retired at the end, or at the end of this year. Um, and, you know, I think we're just seeing a trend throughout the West where, you know, these coal plants are simply becoming uneconomic to operate. And so, you know, I think part of what this policy did that's really important is it, it sets, you know, here is, this is where we're going. We want you to replace that coal with clean resources. You know, we're willing to give you a long runway. You know, we know that this is going to take some time. But, um, you know, I think just really having the legislature lean in on that 2025 date for coal phase out, I think we'll see a lot of actually get to these targets before they're required to. Um, so that's my two cents, and then I'll turn it over to Glenn for the other piece. I forget what the what was the rest of the question. Wasn't there? I didn't. Did I cover everything? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Just the issue with uh, you know, accounting for clean resources uh, for other purposes, uh, non Oh, voluntary. Purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll uh, I'll take a, a, a moment on that. Um, we do, uh, I mean, our approach to this has been that um, renewable energy, it, well, first of all, this is a consumption-based 
standard that we've adopted, S was the renewable portfolio standard that we have now, and that uh, renewable energy certificates are the way to make sure that uh, everybody is actually complying. And our original law from 2006 was uh, uh, incomplete in that regard, and we have uh, made a better system of um, verification that still relies on renewable energy certificates. We feel like it's a, a mechanism that uh, works uh, across markets and it works uh, within both the world of compliance but also for uh, voluntary um, decisions that um, you know like large businesses make. Uh, it's consistent with international protocols, and so we, we do uh, respect the RAC quite a bit in our policy. Okay, are there other questions in the room? If you have a question, just raise your hand so I can see you. Brian. Hi, uh, Brian Deering with Ellison Schneider and Harris. A uh, question for Sarah. You mentioned that one of the things Mexico is looking at is uh, the ability to export some of that high capacity factor wind uh, that you have in your state. And I guess the the question that I was wondering about is, you know, in California, um, we saw the EIM as sort of a mechanism for monetizing some of the excess solar generation in the middle of, middle of the day. And I'm wondering if you see the EIM in the same way, or does it really take new trans Transmission solutions to really facilitate some of those benefits uh, for states like California to see. You should absolutely buy our win. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that I think it takes both. It's going to take both. Um, you know, EIM gets gets us, you know only so far, and then we need to um, probably you know, a lot of the best resources in New Mexico are still. Um, I don't know what the right term is, just transmission constrained, landlocked, I, you know, do not have <laughs> do not have enough transmission to those areas. You know, I, I hear on a regular basis from um, a group of ranchers in the northeast corner of the state where the there are not a lot of folks, um, but there's a whole lot of wind, and, you know, they are just uh, really enthusiastic about the idea of getting that wind to market, um, and it's going to take new, new, new transmission. Um, you know, EIM could be any, anything. You know, it's going to take it's going to take both. Um, we also need to figure out, um, you know, what the next step is on regional markets, and look forward to that conversation and anybody's recommendations on what we should be doing there. Other questions, Claire. Thank you. Uh, Claire Bridenich, uh, Western Power Trading Forum. Uh, i got a question for the Washington folks. Uh, you mentioned uh, the rulemaking on notable counties and non-power attributes. Um, I'd like you to speak more to the other part of it in terms of the rulemaking, with, uh, what you see the issues are in terms of rulemaking um, for load that's served by the EIM and whether there are particular issues that you see there already or if that's something that will have to be further scoped out when you get into that process. Um, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> I mean, we uh, we recognize that there are issues uh, with accounting for uh, transactions through the EIM, uh, and we do want to facilitate the operation of that market. We are we at the Department of Commerce, and I think the state overall are uh, really big fans of uh, markets and the efficient dispatch of. Uh, generating units and pushing uh, polluters off the grid is uh, makes us happy. Uh, but the, exactly what the issues are that need to be um, clarified through rulemaking, it, it, at this point, um, I, I feel like there's just a huge amount that I don't know personally, and and uh, we'll be looking to stakeholders to. Um, help us identify both the questions and come up with the answers over the next couple of years. Yeah, a little bit to add. Um, so from my personal perspective, the IM is working. Our, our investor and utilities seem to be saving money for their customers. So my first thought is don't, don't break it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, 
are the vets doing utilities have a significant amount of um, emissions reductions that is required by this bill? Um, EIM's only 1% of their sales at the moment. Um, but it's working, and if we want to go, if there's opportunities in the day ahead market or other centralized markets, right, for real opportunities to um, be more efficient, we need to explore those. And uh, I, Section 13, as uh, Lauren pointed out, does require both the Commission and Commerce to convene a stakeholder group to consult with the California ISO, utilities, um, all the stakeholders on the compatibility between our our bill and the cap and trade. And the first thing that jumps out to me is you cap and trade works fundamentally in tons of CO2, and ours is on a megawatt hour. Um, and so we have a little bit of a currency issue here. Um, but I imagine there's, I mean, there has to be an opportunity here to harmonize the policies. Um, and we're going to have to get started on that work, um, I suppose, well before June 30th, 2022. You know, I, I think we're just having our first Section 13 consultation with market operators and participants. Way to go, Brad. <laughs> and, and I would just add, um, I was encouraged by um, some of the things that I heard from the California speakers up here. Um, you know, I think we really are looking forward to working with both the market operator and the stakeholders to try to figure this out. And I think, you know, this won't be the first time that folks have had to look at, you know, how does our policy work with these change market forces? And so we're going to need to leverage all the expertise that we can and look forward to doing it. Hey. Yeah, thanks. I have a question for Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm interested in Washington, a lot of the responsibility is going to the utility regulator. In New Mexico, the utility regulator is separately elected. Regulators are separately elected. Are they even bound by executive orders and are they, you know, are they deemed to be allies or cooperative in the effort? Uh, so the executive order is it, you, you rightly um, distinguish between the two. Um, they, you know they um, we do work a lot with the commission though. Um, and so a recent example is so I'm the representative to Weeb for the for the state. But um, and Weeb came and they were presenting on a recent solar uh, rooftop solar study that they had had put together. And so we invited the commissioners to come over and hear the briefing jointly with us at the same time. And, and I think you should expect more of that kind of cooperation between our agencies on education and on um, you know just sharing information and opportunities um, as we go. Um, our our agency has not um, in recent times um, participated in regulatory dockets. Um, it's something we might want to consider doing at some point. We don't currently have the capacity to do so. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we can work together, um, even though they, you know, they do have separate authority and separate elections, and, um, and we certainly respect that um, very much. So um, again, you know, I'm looking forward to, to collaborating with them on this stuff. And, and, uh, but they are not, I don't think they're bound by the executive order. Those are really more about the um, executive branch agencies. Sarah, I have a follow-up question. Uh, it's not related to that necessarily, but to the bill, um, the 80% requirement for renewables and then the carbon-free portion, how is that obligation demonstrated? How does the utility demonstrate that it's met that obligation? So that would be demonstrated through their filings at the commission um, through integrative resource planning and, um, and and those kinds of processes. They have to report um, report to the commission and would be held accountable um, by the by the commission. And if you know, as we monitor it, if things are are not going well or some tweak needs to be made, um, I think we would consider it. But we really negotiated this bill so carefully with all the stakeholders, including the utilities, to try to solve for their problems so that they would be able to meet these standards. Um, so I, I don't, it, they might disagree, but I don't feel like any of the utilities in New Mexico and co-ops were sort of drug into this and through this process at the end. I mean, they were pretty much all at the signing ceremony. Um, so the co-ops, you know, we solved for a number of very specific issues that the co-ops have. In addition to the hydro, um, we solved for, um, 
the issue that a lot of our rural electric co-ops receive power from a GNT, and so that the burden of compliance can be shifted to the GNT. It sort of is in practice anyway, but they wanted a little more comfort around that, so there's language in the bill on that. Um, you know, P&M and El Paso Electric both get a share of their power from Palo Verde um, nuclear generating station, and so they, they wanted to make sure that they didn't have to necessarily get out of that early, and that's why um, some of the language about um, the zero carbon standard and the 80% um, are what they are. Um, you know, uh, every everything that came up from munis and others, I mean, we just really tried to, you know, as time permitted, and it, was, and it was tight and fast, but, you know, really work with everybody in solving their issues so that this would be, these would be targets that they could meet and wouldn't just be coming in for exceptions. And I think, you know, El Paso Electric is an example. They have been a little behind in terms of the absolute renewables procurement because of the cost caps and other things, but I think they now have a plan to get really, you know, start to come into compliance um, soon. And so, it, and, you know, it's, it's costs are on our side and that, that helps too. Will, will they, um, will you use rec retirement as a form of uh, obligation, demonstration of obligation, and will the hydro get a rec similar to what we talked about in Washington and the other carbon-free? So yes, on rec retirements, that is how they demonstrate compliance. Sorry if I missed that in your earlier question. Um, I don't know the detail around the hydro and how that's going to work. Sorry. <laughs> Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Gardner again with Western Resource Advocates. This is more of a philosophical question, I guess, so anybody can feel free to answer it. I feel like we're observing a trend where states are coming out with these uh, carbon or environmental-based policies, and then utilities are kind of beating them to the pun. They have these aggressive policies in place, and utilities, we've seen this happen with Avista, with P&M, with um, Excel Energy most recently. Um, so you know what, that's great state, but we're gonna, we're gonna beat it. You know, we're, we're able to meet that policy. Um, thanks, but we're already, we're already ahead of you. And I think that's a great situation to be in. My question for you is, are we seeing this happen with utilities purely because of economics when we know that um, the price for fossil fuels um, is, is higher than renewables? Or is this um, coming more from a collaboration between state leadership and the utilities? Or is it a combination of the two? And maybe if you could just elaborate on that. Thanks. Um, thank you. So, um, you know, obviously can't speak for the utilities themselves, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate the power of customer demand here. Um, you know, I think a lot of what you're seeing from utilities is coming, you know, yes, based on economics, you know, we're seeing clean energy come in at prices lower than conventional energy sources. I mean, that's just, that's just a market fact, right? Um, but you also have, I think, a lot of uh, large customers and institutional customers, you know, whether they're governments or, you know, universities um, who are really pushing the envelope on, you know, wanting to do this transition sooner rather than later. And I, I don't think we can really underestimate the power of that. I mean, utilities do respond to customer you know, demand, and um, I think we have a couple of good examples in Washington State where, you know, Microsoft, for example, um, came out and negotiated a special contract with Puget Sound Energy, our largest power provider. Um, we have uh, the same utility, um, also offered a direct access, you know, basically direct access type of program uh, for large commercial customers, which the state signed on to. So we had a number of state agencies that signed on to purchase 100% uh, renewable energy. Um, so yes, I think it is really important for to engage with utilities at a policy level to make sure that, you know, the policies that we do enact, uh, you know, which are expressing that desire for clean energy from customers are gonna work for the utilities that have to implement them. But I also just wouldn't, you know, I, I think that the public demand for this uh, is really part of what's driving this transition. It's a great question and that's a great answer and I really agree that the customer demand is a, a large part of it, both large customers and residential customers. Um, I also think economics makes everything easier <laughs> when you're not forcing the issue um, on against the grain on economics. 
Um, I think the utilities are starting to understand ways that they can make money from owning and, you know, procuring renewables, and that's a, um, you know, that can be a good thing. Um, it, it done right, um, and then, but leadership has in the New Mexico case uh, mattered um, and personal relationships between, you know, the, the, the governor and the executives at the utilities and their ability to sit together and talk about, okay, how are we going to do this together and understand that that was going to, to mean something um, that was significant and that happened early in the legislative session with several of the executives and, um, you know, so, and some of them already had, as you mentioned, Excel, I mean, they, they operate as SPS in New Mexico and they already had really strong um, carbon reduction goals. So um, all, of, all of those things contributed to the right kind of culture where we were able to get something done quickly this session. Do we have questions on the phone? Is an opportunity for questions on the phone? Noreen, do we have anybody in the queue? Please press pound two on your telephone keypad if you wish to ask a question. We don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, any other questions in the room? Sorry, we just got a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, caller on the phone, if you could identify yourself, please. Yes, this is Arthur O'Donnell, the Energy Overseer in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I have a question for Sarah about the Energy Transition Act provision for having replacement resources in the same school district as the San Juan generation. Uh, I'm concerned about the capacity of that area to host 400 megawatts of new resources. Uh, will your agency, your department, be taking um, that on? And then I have a question for Washington after that. Hi, Art. Thanks for your question. Um, so, uh, good question. So, the, the bill says that up to 450 megawatts of replacement power can be located um, in the in the school district um, where the, the coal plant is being, where the coal units are being retired. Um, and that was very important uh, because of the tax-based issues uh, in Farmington and um, and it's it's complicated. It's tough because Farmington, where the coal plant is, is not PNM service territory. So when you know, you could understand that when they go out to to look at okay, in an ideal world where would we locate replacement power, it might not necessarily you know even though transmission is there, it might not necessarily be in the school district. So there's a bit has been a bit of a tension where the replacement power will be, how much of it will be renewable, how much of it will be gas, all of these things. And we don't know the answer of how that's going to play out yet. PNM had an RFP out. We expect them to um, submit their filing to the commission at the end of this month. Um, they're, they're still working through their modeling, um, and we expect to see, you know, a bit more of a playbook of what they're thinking and how much of that replacement power will be um, will be located in that school district um, or in other parts of the state. So. I don't have a really clear answer for you yet because we, we need to see what P&M files and, and I expect that the ultimate answer will be a, a negotiated outcome through the commission process. Thanks. And your question for Washington? Um, yeah, I'm surprised that uh, I, there don't seem to be any special provisions or differences for public power in Washington State since there's so many publicly owned entities um, in, in the bill and in the initiative. Can somebody address that? Uh, this is Glenn Blackman from the Department the, the jurisdiction of the WUTC. Yeah, so in Washington, uh, consumer-owned utilities are not regulated by uh, the State uh, Utilities and Transportation Commission. But uh, beginning with the initiative in 2006, uh, it's been a policy that was applied across the board to utilities serving retail customers. Um, there was in that law, a provision that exempted utilities with fewer than 25,000 customers, and that, you know, had the effect of exempting quite a few um, municipal and co-op uh, utilities in the state uh, out of roughly 65 utilities, 17 were covered by that law. This law, um, uh, the new one, applies to all utilities regardless of size, and uh, it's a state policy that is implemented through all of the utilities, and um, there's really not, I don't, 
I'm not sure why we would exempt the consumer owned utilities. Uh, it didn't really come up that much in, in discussions. Okay. Just curious because okay, uh, have, in California, ahead. any municipal utility would highly uh, object to being regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. So. Right. And, and I think the answer was the Washington publics are not uh, regulated by the Washington Utility Commission. Uh, so we've got, uh, we are going to transition to the next agenda item, gonna, but I'm going to allow one last question and then we'll transition. Okay. Thank you. My name is C.B. Hall. Um, I work at MCE. Thank you for the presentations. Um, with respect to the Washington uh, rules, I just have a question about um, how they relate to EIM. Um, if, if, for instance, hydro or renewables are made available to the EIM and, and are deemed delivered into California, will those volumes be eligible for your REC uh, creation? Uh, you know, I think that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Not to answer that question, but to begin that discussion. And, uh, you know, what I've tried to um, convey so far, A, is that um, uh, if those renewable energy certificates are used for compliance in Washington, and, and they can only be used in a, in a limited category because um, what you're talking about would leave behind an unbundled rack, then uh, we think that um, your utility and others uh, who might want to use that hydro should ask a lot of questions about the non-power attributes that um, you might think are with that power but might not be. Uh, it raises this question about double counting. And then the second point that I have tried to make here today is we look forward to working with the market operators and participants to come up with a good solution so that uh, resources get their full value but nothing gets double counted. Thanks. So I'm going to invite uh, Commissioner Jordan White from the City of Utah to come up and join the panelists at that table while we, I, while I set up the next agenda item. Um, so we've heard from uh, four different states that have different uh, carbon reduction policies or carbon accounting uh, rules uh, that are in place or will be in place soon. And what we know is the EIM is made up of far more than those four states. And so we wanted to hear from the other states uh, that have EIM participants and get their perspectives on on this topic of how the EIM goes about addressing GHG um, and, and kind of considerations from their perspective. So we'll start with uh, Commissioner White. Well, thanks, Therese, and thanks to the uh, Regional Issues Forum for community discussion. This has been extremely informative and um, helpful thus far. I feel a little bit lonely now with all the folks. You're welcome to come back up here, Sarah. <laughs> I, I that, wanted but. them to stay. <laughs> um, just, just to begin, of course, I have to give a couple disclaimers. First of all, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Utah Commission or the Utah Legislature or Governor. I'm, I'm a, I am a commissioner in Utah. I am also chair of the um, EIM Body of State Regulators, but I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of that group. We have a very good collaborative relationship that we speak um, when we have consensus on an issue and and we do disagree on things and we have robust discussions but we are you know thoughtful and deliberate when we do so and so again these are my opinions alone so so why um, you know again and, and let me just say this too I know we have folks on the call I mean I'm, yeah folks on the line from other states who can apply, and I certainly hope that we'll have other discussions among other state officials or commissioners, et cetera, but um, I'll, maybe I'll kick things off. So why does, um, you know, this, you know, Utah commissioner, why am I here, why do I care um, about this issue? Um, you know, certainly it's probably, I don't know who pointed this out, but, you know, it could, maybe it was Tony about the potential of the legislators speaking together. Um, that would be helpful. I think that's probably a little bit late in the game right now, but what I am encouraged by is the fact that we have a lot of smart folks. Um, I've heard the, the ability uh, when you go ahead and you're um, beginning the process of implementing this or some flexibility. So let me just give you some thoughts about kind of where I stand and maybe some kind of prayers or hopes as, as you go forward um, in this process. You know, Utah, you know, as a commissioner, you know, the EIM is a lot of things to a lot of different folks. 
My, my economic regulator world is, is, is somewhat narrowly focused by statute, at least in Utah. And I know that other commissioners have a different kind of um, focus, but I, I look to the EIM as, you know, a hopeful, hopefully delivering benefits, and thus far they've been very encouraging. And by benefits, from my perspective, that means decreased net power costs and increased reliability. And again, that's been encouraged, very encouraging thus far. And if you look back over the past, you know, since 2014, since the, the EIM was stood up, um, it's been pretty monumental in terms of the amount of education, trust building, et cetera, among those EIM entity states and, and, and their regulators. And so I think to me that's very encouraging. I guess my concern going forward, and, and let me just say, I, I, I have complete and utter respect for um, states' you know, rights to implement carbon policies and those legislatures. This is really not about any type of value judgment on that issue. Um, it, it's more about preservation of, I think, I don't know who said it earlier about not breaking it. We, we have a good thing, and I, and I just want to, I guess my prayer and, and hope um, as we go forward is that the discussion is very deliberate and careful. Um, I'm concerned about, um, you know, over complexity potentially, um, you know, eroding the optimization tool. I know we have very smart folks at Kaiso who are working and thinking through those issues very um, carefully. But you know, with complexity um, comes a few potential issues that, that raise concerns for me. One, one, one being, um, and this is just a simple one. I, I'll, I'll, I'll give a, uh, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'll put my. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of channel the, the consumer advocates or ratepayer advocates um, on this issue is that, you know, in Utah, from a net power cost perspective, you know, EI and benefits are, are good, but it's really, at you know, this point, a very small slice of the total net power costs. I'm a little bit concerned if we have, you know, uh, counterfactuals on counterfactuals on counterfactuals, it's going to be extremely cumbersome and difficult for those advocates to actually vet, um, you know, those costs and benefits. and and and, and and, and I'm, what I'm worried about is that, um, you know, with some good power cost adjustment mechanisms in, in all the states, that maybe create complications in terms of how streamlined those can be. Um, again, the complexities, um, you know, there's definitely the issue of um, complexity creates opportunities sometimes for the for un, unfortunately for certain parties to gain the system, and and that's the concern I guess is that you know going forward. Um, really be careful about that. I'm not sure that the market monitor will be involved in that, but that, that that's a concern. Again, we've, you know, the energy crisis was many, many years ago in, in, the, in the rearview mirror, but for non-carbon policy kind of inland states, that's still kind of what they recognize. So I would hate to have any kind of um, issue with the, the trust building that we've achieved thus far just to be eroded in that respect. Um, Again, the challenges of multi-state utilities. I mean, I know that a lot of us, especially on the, the Bosser, um, you know, are in states with multi-state utilities. I, I hope that, and you know, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's this willingness to have the discussions. But, but certainly, um, you know, uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, for many years we've had an integrated um, system, at least with the Pacific Core system. And so I would, I would be careful about it, making sure that the discussions happen in the appropriate way that there really is the, the, you know, we get the right folks in the right room talking about the realities of how to make all those systems match up and that we don't um, erode that, the, the, um, the, the efficiencies we've um, achieved thus far. Um, let's see, again, I don't want to talk this whole time because I know we have other folks. Um, one other issue is, you know, you know I want to make sure that, um, what, whatever happens going forward that, um, you know, we do so in a technology neutral way. I think that you need to figure out what the, what kind of attributes you want to incent and, and, and be careful about that because I think that that's going to potentially be a challenge for the efficiency of the market if, if you're trying to drive one technology over the other. Um, certainly as a non-carbon policy state, again, it's no value judgment on other states, but we want to make sure that um, those carbon policy states, non-carbon policy states are held harmless. In other words, those customers are held harmless from kind of direct cost imputation from um, how it's achieved. Um, finally, um, you know, I've got to give a shout out to reliability, which is, again, I think one thing that people don't talk a lot about with respect to what the EIM could deliver and, and potentially uh, markets in general is increased optimization of transition assets. 
Um, so, you know, again, just a, a little um, small request on my part to to consider that as you as you design this and try to figure out, you know, this very complex you know pieces of the puzzle and how they'll work together is, is to to make sure that that is not eroded going forward. So again, I, I I've asked a lot of prayers. I know that these are big asks, but again, it's it's, it's really coming from a place that. Um, this, the EIM really has been a tool for the entire West. Um, and again, a lot of different stakeholders in a lot of different states get benefits from it, but it's, it's, a, very, it's a very tender time, I guess, is what I'd say in terms of the, the development of the EIM, is that we have momentum, and this is really a critical, critical point in time. It, it, it can either, you know, depending on what happens with trying to, to figure out how to implement these policies, it could potentially, you know, suffocate or, or erode, or the, the of it could, optics of it could be put off kilter, especially from a, uh, a legislative um, standpoint in non-carbon policy states. So again, um, be cognizant of that fact that uh, we, we've really come a long way with respect to to, to gaining trust in markets. So so it's really, I mean, this is mission, mission critical for the folks in this room is that we, we, we really are counting on you guys to get together and to, and to talk, be collaborative, listen to each other, maybe not be so ambitious um, in terms of states, policies, and trying to get make it do everything. Try to be as simple as possible. I know that's an easy thing for a, a dumb commissioner to say, but try to be it, it, to keep the, the market and, and, and implementation of these policies as simple as possible because I think that's going to go a long way. So anyway, I've – Said probably too much. I'm I'm happy to hear um, or open it up to other folks from other states. I know that we have some folks on the line, but Therese. Great, thanks, Commissioner White. Do we have others from other states that have perspective? I think we may have one on the phone. So again, you can um, enter the queue by pressing pound two. And Noreen, let me know if anybody is in the queue. We do have a question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is Christine Raper calling from Idaho. Can you all hear me? Yes, thank you, Christine. Go ahead. Well, uh, I give all the same caveats that Jordan did at the beginning. I'm not speaking on behalf of my commission or the body of state regulators, but um, as an interested party on multiple levels, um, I, I want to um, Jordan is much more eloquent in the way that he relays information than I am. Um, I, I agree with everything he said. I, I think that adding policy into an economic universe when you're bringing in more and more states with more and more diverse policy interests um, makes the system more fragile. Um, we as economic regulators, you know, the, the, the utility commissions of the states, we, we are supposed to be economic regulators. And there's a difference between economic regulating and policy-driven economics, uh, that are, which are the decisions being made within the state. And the utility commissions, more or less, are having those things imposed upon them, right? We're, we're told by our state government how they want things to be done and then we enforce it based on the authority that is granted to us by the legislature and ultimately the governor. So I think that adding policy on top of the economic regulation that we do, the EIM is clearly an economic benefit to the customers. I think that there's no question in saying that, in making that statement. But the more that you add policy considerations of the many different states involved on top of that economic regulation, the more tenuous that gets. And the, I, I heard some comments about um, customer-driven. Things are customer-driven, and our utilities are going in that direction too. But I constantly remind people that um, customer driven doesn't mean that the spectrum moves, it means that the spectrum lengthens. So, so think of a rubber band. You're, you're not moving that rubber band and it's still the same tautness. You're 
holding it in place and stretching it thinner. And I guess I think of the low-income customers when I make that consideration. Um, customer choice and those things are real, and we are moving in that direction, and regulators all over the country are having to consider that and grapple with that and decide where that's going to go. But you can't forget about the guy who really only – utilizes, you know, his electricity for for the simplest things in order to be able to, you know, cook dinner or run his refrigerator in his house. Um, and so the more you add policy on top of the true economics, the harder it is for that guy. And the utility still has to serve that customer. So I guess on top of Jordan's cautions, I would just caution that you not forget that in, in the move to um, satisfying customers' wants and needs, you don't forget about those people, you know, grandma who still has the, the um, dial telephone, you know, and couldn't utilize a, a cell phone if she tried. That, you have to remember those other customers. So I apologize that there was no question in that, but I thought Jordan was probably throwing out the um, – the line to me when he was talking about other people on the phone chiming in. That's right. <laughs> and we did just want perspective, so no need for a question on that. Are, are there others in the room or uh, from other states? I mean, I think that the idea here was to get perspectives from those states that don't have carbon accounting or don't have a carbon policy and considerations as, as we kind of walk through this process of bringing in the, the states with new carbon policy. Yeah, and I'm happy to take questions. Or if there's, you know, I know we have some of the other folks or commissioners from states with carbon policy, so if they want to chime into it too, that's fine too. But unless you just want to hear me talk for the next 15 minutes, it's unlikely. Go ahead, Cliff. Uh, Chris, this is Cliff Rechaff, and we we miss you. you sh we miss you over here. Too bad you couldn't come in person. Uh, I would. This is a much longer conversation and a very important one. And I would just add two quick points uh, to in response to what you said. You're absolutely right that having policy complicates and makes greater the challenges of economic regulators. But we have been doing that in California at a very large scale for the past eight, ten years. And it is more complicated with multi-states, but it, it's also something that. We have done successfully while also managing reliability, safety, and affordability. And the other point I would make is, to me, and Jordan talked about the momentum that's been built. To me, the the the, the opportunity posed by all of the new carbon policies that have been adopted is that we, if we do expand regional cooperation in the EIM, we have the ability to implement those programs more affordably because with a regional market there's many more opportunities for lower course resources, resource sharing, and that's been our experience in California. We want to build on it, so in some ways it's, it's exactly the, out, the, the time to realize the benefits that these regional policies and regional cooperation can present to us in, in implementing our policy-driven goals. So we'll have much more uh, conversation on data about this going forward. I just wanted to offer those two, two quick thoughts. Thank you. Other questions or perspectives? In the room or on the phone? So this is Pam with Portland General Electric, and I think one of the takeaways that I have from this morning, and I really appreciate all the panelists coming and sharing their perspectives, is that there is a lot of the same opportunities for cross-state collaboration and resource sharing and, and knowledge sharing that we had when we started the EIM. And that one of the big benefits of the EIM, I think, has been building relationships across utilities and across states. And I'm wondering if, and this is a big question for really this whole room, is what, what are some of the the takeaways or lessons learned that we had from standing up the EIM and building these cross-state collaborations that we could maybe share with our uh, carbon regulator uh, friends who are here today um, and help maybe get that conversation or that collaboration jump-started and maybe get the benefits of that interstate relationship going more quickly. 
No, that's, that's a good question. I, I mean, you, you know, I, I look back and again, and I mean, I know there's Travis, other folks who were from there in, you know, clip and others from the from the beginning of this discussion. And, and really, if you kind of look at the evolution of it, what it's taken, honestly, is just lots and lots of, you know, you know, hours and hours in conference rooms, kind of understanding kind of like the, the, the perspectives and really education. I mean, that's what I think has been a key for at least the body of state regulators. Again, I'm not speaking for them, but in terms of like just understanding how the market works, because, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the, a lot of the early days were kind of jousting at windmills that we didn't really understand. And that's really if we can kind of understand, you know, what what is the ultimate, you know, um, where are you trying to get to in terms of the carbon regulators? And if you can if you can know what, where you, what you're trying to achieve, you can build the right map and try to get there so you don't have perverse incentives or counteracting, per, per, you know, incentives, et cetera. I mean, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Cliff said, Commissioner Rechoff, and, um, you, you know, it's it's really interesting because, you know, if you look at what the what the EIM can deliver, again, it's such a critical point right now because if if, if the EIM can be successful and potentially evolve and deliver more benefits and integrate more, more renewables, you could have a counter effect of actually, um, you, you know, potentially, uh, you know, uh, going going contrary to the objectives of the carbon regulators. And really, that's that's the kind of the irony is it's that very delicate balance right now of like kind of learning and figuring out how these pieces of the puzzle work together, and not trying to be you know frankly too having too much pride of ownership in your own carbon policies, and, and really trying to like be maybe step back a second and try to figure out you know what the ultimate goal is among the states. I mean, we talk a lot among among site regulators. We don't always agree, but we talk a lot, and, and typically after. Five to fifteen hours, we agree on one thing or the other. <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Zakella from NRDC. Um, just wanted to say, and I think what the what the EIM is going for is it delivers, it works. You know, there's six hundred and fifty million dollars in benefits for participants so far. And it's giving people access to lower cost energy across the region and better utilization of the renewable energy resources and the transmission that's being committed to it. So I think it's proved its case uh, over and over again, which is why we're seeing participation from public utilities too and folks that haven't usually, uh, it's just sort of like dogs and cats laying down together. They're doing it because it makes sense for their customers, makes sense um, overall. I don't think that you know you shouldn't ignore the fact that there's a cost to not doing anything regionally. Um, there's that we're not going to outrun or ignore the fact that there are carbon impacts that we're already facing. We've had the most historic fires we've ever seen in the last two years in a row in California. We're seeing all kinds of impacts across the West, and and uh, you know I, I think there is time for concerted action to happen and people to line up together to try to make that happen. And, uh, you know, we start to see the states that have the highest amount of the electricity load by far in the West are the ones that are aligned now. That's going to have a profound effect long term on the generation stack. And we can't ignore that. We need to start thinking about how we get past that to go to your point, Commissioner, about reliability being central to that. It's NRDC's perspective, I think, as Cliff's uh, Commissioner Rex often uh, pointed out, is that regional coordination is one way to get at that very affordably, to take advantage of the resource profiles that we have in all of our states, including the states that are now predominantly coal states, which have outstanding renewable energy resources, too. So lots of opportunity to go around here. And, uh, you know, I guess that's my little stump speech. Sorry. You're not on the... Okay. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that comment because, you know, I was, you look at the, a, a map of the Western interconnection, you look at kind of like where a lot of the, as you pointed out, a lot of the carbon policies of states going 100, et cetera, and you look at the fact that, you know, California, you know, can't always be, a, you know, a net importer. But you you got to figure out at some point in order to achieve those policies, someone's got to have the capacity rock. And that's the question. So I mean, you're getting to the point of like, I don't think that we can, whatever the we is, whatever the goal end goal is, that I think that that's got to be done collaboratively. And that's been really the benefit of the Western Interconnection is the diverse loads, topography. It, it's really, 
Yeah, I mean, I'll say it again. I know, I know people accuse me from my old days as therapist of being a little touchy feely, but really, we really are, we really are stronger in, in uh, t together when, when we work together and, and really optimize the, the, the generation and transition assets. So, uh, we have one last comment and then we're going to transition. We are not on. You're not on. Arthur up on something. Huh? There, you there you go. You're on. You're on now. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> Arthur Halvenstock, following up on something that Commissioner Rexhoffen had said regarding the interaction of policy and economics. As we look into the future and we see policy driving increased electrification of the transportation sector and other sectors of the economy, a lot of other changes that are going to affect the energy grid. Uh, my concern would be, and I think it's pretty widely shared, that the failure to include policy in economics makes it more fragile, not less. And we need to be thinking about how policy is changing the entire system and incorporating that as best as we can into our economic forecast so that we're making the right decisions now. We're going to see a pretty substantial increase in load as we see increased electrification. We're going to see a way that from the distribution side, the way customers interact with the grid to the larger uh, transmission bulk system works, we need to be factoring that in because we know that the future is going to be very different than the past and we need to do our best to forecast that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to pick up on something that Commissioner White said about really wanting to understand the policy objectives. Um, if we can be clear about policy objectives and understand how best to implement them. That's a little bit of the way we tried to structure the day. Uh, so the morning was intended for all of you to kind of get a sense for what are the policies that have been passed, uh, let you identify the folks that are involved in those so that maybe at lunch you have questions for them. You can, <laughs> you can ask them questions and then we'll transition to the afternoon and talk about the market and talk about what the market um, uh, can do, uh, maybe what the market can't do, and hear from market participants and stakeholders about uh, some of the issues and considerations as we go to kind of uh, solve it together. So um, with that, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, the cafe is downstairs. They say they're ready, they're ready for us. Um, and then again, just a reminder for those that are non-merchant, non-trading, um, and want to have a tour of the control room, uh, it is on the other side of the lobby, I assume you could probably just meet somebody in the lobby. Security kiosk. And then be back at 1 o'clock. We will start on time. I work